Okay, we're starting the broadcast. We're ready to go. We'll just give the public a couple of minutes to log in. All right. Antoinette, change your name. How do I do that? <laughs> um, if you click on your picture, there's those three little dots that pop up. I think if you click on that, you can change your name. <laughs> we have two Sarahs and two Kristens. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I, I, is this either error? Because I'm not seeing it. I see mute my audio, stop video, pin video, hide self. Go to the, go to participants panel. Okay. And then, um, highlight your <laughs> highlight you and it says more and then um, you should be able to change your name there guys i'm the worst is the baby on the agenda i love it <laughs> <laughs> um i'm sorry this is well congratulations antoinette yeah congratulations. thank you thank you Sorry, that's the extent of my tech support. No, I know. I, I don't know. I don't know if it'll let me because it's through like the panelists thing. Right. Um, and, but I, and, I didn't get the email. I looked and I didn't have it. So thanks for forwarding it to me, Kristen. That's okay. Um, is our admin on? Can they go in and change it? And Rob, change, Rob, can you change that? Yeah, I'll take care of that right now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, we all set? We are live. Yes, we're ready to go, Larry. I don't have a table, but I have a gavel. Uh, welcome everybody to the July 9th, 2020 Board Business and Conference Meeting of the School District of Haverford Township. If you could, uh, everybody could rise or whatever you'd like to do for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the Republic, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Mr. Regal, could you call the roll, please? Okay. Dr. Crispin? Here. Mr. Fleischer? Here. Uh, Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Minji? Ms. Minji? Is she here? Here, here. Okay. Mr. Sinta? Here. Mr. Schwartz? Here. Ms. Snodgrass? Here. Ms. Wiedemann? Here. Mr. Feinberg? Here. Thank you, Bob. Uh, just like to make a note that item 6B on the agenda uh, is going to be deferred to a future meeting. So uh, you can strike that uh, from, from uh, the agenda, item 6B. Uh, next item, I'll accept a motion to approve the official minutes from the June 18th, 2020 regular public board meeting. Sinto moves. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next item is public comment. Uh, and I understand that we have uh, a number of comments that uh, were sent in uh, during the day today. Anna, do you want to go ahead with those? Uh, yes, we did, Mr. Feinberg. I'll start now. Uh, the first one is from Erin Ingrafia. And Erin, oh, I had her address a second ago. When I, oh, it's 2431 Linden Drive in Havertown. Dear school board members, I will have a kindergartner and a sixth grader in the district this fall. The short video of, of my comment is that I would prefer to have my children in school, but only if it can be done with reasonably safe, reasonable safety for all students and staff. I realize that I am at an advantage of someone who runs their own business in that I can be a stay-at-home mom when needed. That said, I don't think teachers should have to risk their lives because our society is set up so poorly for working parents. I have seemingly healthy children, but one has asthma. Even so, they both traded coughs and colds for almost the whole winter last year. They were mild and didn't keep them out of school, but if we had a more stringent sick policy, as we should, 
for any symptom that might be COVID-19, they would end up home most of the time anyway. I know most teachers I have spoken with are nervous. They wanna see their students, even if it's just to get to know them before we inevitably end back in yellow or red for flu season, but don't have any real reassurance of how this will all work. If I keep my children home, I prefer not to pull them from the district, but have a robust online learning option with their peers and have it for teachers. A few important questions that I've seen. If someone in my class or school tests positive and I have to isolate for 14 days, does that come out of my sick time? And or will I be expected to teach remotely during that time? If I'm an employee who gets sick at school, would they qualify for workman's comp? Similarly, if an employee or their family die from complications to COVID, would they be eligible to sue the district for putting them in harm's way? Does this possibility make liability insurance too costly for the school to take on? Are schools going to receive extra federal or state funding for grief counselors if a member of the student body or staff dies? If you haven't already seen this or read it, I think these are good questions and all must be answered before we can ask our students and staff to return in only a little over a month. Um, it references a website, relentlessschoolnurse.com. Thank you for your time. I know these are difficult decisions and they weigh heavy on all of us. Erin. Um, the next one is from Alex Brophy and Kate Lenahan. Uh, we live at 133 East Benedict Avenue in Havertown and are parents of a rising third grader at Chester Wald Elementary School. We write to express our substantial concerns with the school district's plans to reopen this fall at immediate 100% capacity as summarized in Dr. Rushi's July 2nd email. There are four major concerns that we do not believe have been addressed by the school district. Unless the school district can provide information that alleviates these concerns, we urge the school board to vote against the current reopening plan and insist instead on the school district putting forth a revised plan with a hybrid of in-person and online learning. Our four main questions and concerns are as follows. One, why is our school district following reopening guidance from less densely populated jurisdictions such as Bucks and Chester instead of looking at similar townships such as Upper Darby and Lower Marion, which have taken a more cautious approach to reopening schools? Two, the results of the school district's recent survey were clear. Over two thirds of Haverford Township parents do not want their children to return to school five days a week during the pandemic. Why has the school district disregarded the preference of 67.4% of township parents to not have students attend five days a week, including the 56.1% of parents who prefer a hybrid of in-person and online learning? Three, are we are being continuously told and rightfully so to socially distance at least six feet from others. Why is the school district adopting the WHO's more lenient three foot social distancing recommendations instead of the CDC's and Pennsylvania's six foot guidelines. Four, if students are sitting two to a seat on a bus, they will be unable to maintain even the who's lower three foot minimum of social distancing. Doesn't that serve to undermine the effort being made to socially distance in classrooms and other school facilities? If the school district at the very least adopts a hybrid approach combining in-person and online learning for September to October, perhaps with a plan to reassess by the end of October, we believe that we believe that would be a much more responsible and safer way of cautiously giving students some in-person instruction while continually assessing the public health consequences. The reality is that neither our country nor our state has this pandemic under control, and we simply do not know what the consequences of even a partial reopening of schools will be, much less a full reopening. The safety of our schools, faculty, and staff is simply too important for the school district to get this wrong. Again, if the school district cannot adequately answer these important questions detailed above, we urge the school board to vote against the current reopening plan and insist on a hybrid model. Thank you for your time and service to our community. The next comment comes from Wendy Klein Keene from 716 Beechwood Drive, Havertown, PA. Dear school board members, thank you for your service, especially during these unforeseen and challenging times. As a parent of a Chester Walt student at a heightened risk of serious complications from COVID-19, I feel that it's important to voice my concern that whatever is done in the fall, we ensure that we keep everyone, staff, teachers, and students, and their families safe. While well, I want nothing more than to send my son back to school as it was, I think we have to balance those desires with the need to ensure that everyone is safe while at the same time benefiting from the best education possible. 
It seems that in light of the clear resurgence of cases around the country, the best course of action is to plan for meaningful remote education with real programming that lasts several hours each day and permits teachers and students to meaningful, in, meaningfully interact. Excuse me, with the potential for limited in-person education where students and staff and teachers can respect social distancing and masking requirements. I would want nothing less for my son and for the other educators and children in our community than for everyone to remain safe, healthy, and well-educated. Thank you. Our next comment is from Rana Laskowski and Adam Laskowski. We live at 128 East Benedict Avenue in Havertown and are parents of a rising first grader at Chestnutwald Elementary School. We write to express our substantial concern with the school district's plans to reopen this fall at an immediate 100% capacity as summarized in Dr. Rushi's July 3rd email. Parents, especially working parents, students, and teachers need to have a schedule that they can consistently follow throughout the school year. We know that COVID-19 is here to stay through the next year until a vaccine is ready and distributed. Full capacity is not sustainable while the virus and other viruses surge in the colder months. The parents, children, and teachers will not be able to keep up with the school changing the model back to all virtual or even hybrid model. There are ways, I'm sorry, there are way too many schedules, behaviors, and learning methods that will be heavily impacted. Our strong opinion would be either of these two suggestions that would remain the schedule for the entire school year. Suggestion A, a hybrid schedule of in-person and remote learning that will both allow for greater social distancing and cut down on the number of people at schools and on buses at once. This hybrid approach is also the clear choice of parents in the school district. As summarized at the June 18th school board meeting, the recent survey of parents revealed that 67.4% of Haverford Township parents prefer either a hybrid of in-person and remote learning or remote learning only. The hybrid was a choice of the clear majority of parents, 56.1%. Parents understand the importance of exercising caution and phasing in school reopening. Why doesn't the school district? Suggestion B, the middle and high school students would, re would remain, I'm sorry, would reopen this fall at 100% virtual learning. The print is very small, I apologize. The elementary school students uh, would use each elementary school, the middle school and high school spread out with more than enough space and reopen and remain at 100% full capacity for the entire school year. Elementary school students need much more hands-on with help, not only with learning methods, but with technology. And this method would allow for them to have in-person learning while also allowing six feet social distancing. Middle and high school students are much more capable of using technology and have the attention span to learn remotely. If there is room, the suggestion could also allow for all students who have learning disabilities or need other types of help to possibly get in-person as well. While I don't have data on this, I have personally heard that the middle and high school students were well challenged and were able to keep up with the remote learning last year and felt that they had a good amount of live communication with their teachers. With this method, method I personally don't care if my child would stay at Chestnutwald or if she would attend the middle school or high school. I would just be happy to stick with one schedule for the entire school year that was safe and had common sense at the core of it. Finally, I am a strong proponent of children wearing masks or face coverings throughout the school day. Our child is only six years old and we have a three and a half year old as well and we are working hard to show them that it is normal. It will keep them safe and other kids are doing it. So let's play along to help our community. We have them wear masks when required and show them pictures of other children and friends doing the same. I hope the school district will offer some talking points to parents about how they can normalize mask wearing for their, for their kids. Masks and science are not up for debate despite what some parents and politicians say. In conclusion, we simply do not know what the consequences of what a full reopening will be. However, the safety of our children, our educators, and the school staff is simply too important for us to get this wrong. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next comment is from Amy Slowicki. She is a 2424 Linden Drive, Chestnut Wall parent. I would like to express my concerns about the district considering opening school with full in-person learning, even in the current green phase. The PADOE report stated that a hybrid model would be the best interest of public health and the other needs of students, educational, mental, and physical health, and emotional support. Why would the district focus on starting the year with all students in school, a scenario that by the state's models will increase the rate of spread, launching us into a hybrid or completely virtual model sooner? Surely everyone must realize that we will be the hybrid stage at some point, likely in the fall. I would propose starting the school year with this model. This model is demonstrated by 
by the PA DOE report offers the best opportunity to slow the spread while still offering in-person opportunity. Starting here alleviates the in inevitable disruption to students when we have to move to the hybrid model anyway. It allows both teachers and students the time and resources to adjust to this new way of schooling and hopefully extends the length of time our children can have some, at least some in-person instruction before moving to a virtual phase. I'm also concerned about our teachers, what we are asking them to do and relatively few resources they have to do it. Our teachers and all adults in our school deserve to be working in the safest setting possible. They also deserve an opportunity to adjust to this new normal in the best way possible, limiting disruptions as much as possible on how they are asked to do their job. Tonight's meeting is taking place over Zoom. If it is truly safe for 24 students to be in a classroom with one to two adults, five days a week for full days, it should be safe for our school board to meet in person open to the public, but we know it is not. Please con consider committing to starting the school year in a hybrid model now. It proves stability, it will help alleviate the anxiety of the unknown for the families and allows our community to move forward and address other challenges like childcare for those that need it. The next comment is from Julie Walden at 211 Moreland Avenue. Hello, hope you all are well, and I hope that our teachers and families are all healthy. I am a parent of a Cooperstown fourth grader. My greatest concern is for the teachers and ensuring that they have all tools for effective teaching and engaging students, most especially if we are mostly or entirely remote learning. Our, fam our family had a horrible time with Google Classroom, and I pray that this platform is not used again. As for remote learning, I'm hoping that there are real guidelines and support for teachers who have children at home and for parents or, or caregivers who cannot work from the home in order to help elementary school children participate in remote learning. All this said, I wish with all my heart that we can establish safe in-person schooling with appropriate safety measures. Okay, our last comment is from Sarah McCafferty at 645 Hazelwood Road in Ardmore. Good evening, I would like to submit the following for for the upcoming school board meeting. Students at Haverford High School have created a petition to demand the school district upholds its promise of a fair and equitable education for all students. In the letter accompanying the petition, the students write, while we commend the school district of Haverford Township's response to recent events published on June 1st, we would like to identify that there are still more, there are still more needed discussions and actions to be held, to be had before Haverford can claim that it stands for an inclusive space. In April, 2018, the Haverford the Havertown Community Action Network, HCAM, published a report titled Diversity and Inclusion in the School District of Haverford Township. This report highlighted the racial harassment and hostility in our schools and included the statistic that while black students make up 4.3% of the student population, they account for 18.1% of student suspensions. They also suggested a list of actions that the school board should take to promote racial justice. Since its publishing, there have been little to no actions to bring effective change. This is unacceptable. You have a responsibility to the students you serve to not only set the policies that will affect how we learn, but to uphold the visions and goals for inside and outside of the classroom. This is particularly important when speaking about students from marginalized backgrounds whose interests may not be reflected in the wider society. My question is, what steps are the school district taking to address these inequities in education? Does the school district intend to have listening sessions with their BIPOC students, alumni, and community members? Will the school district be hiring an administrator to oversee diversity and inclusion efforts in the school district to ensure that it does not get pushed to the back burner? Sincerely. Is that everybody? Yes, thank you. I wanna thank everybody for their comments. Um, just like to take a minute to talk about the reopening uh, process thus far. Um, there is no recommendation from the administration yet in terms of uh, a, a final plan by any means. Uh, if you've been watching the both the news at the national and the state level, uh, this is very fluid. Things are changing every day. Um, there's policy statements coming out of Harrisburg and Washington that impact uh, how, how we're going to be able to open. Um, one of the reasons that the board is meeting weekly of this month is because we recognize that this is fluid. Um, you, you will be hearing from a variety of, of folks over the next couple of weeks. Um, there is a, a, a target for the board 
to uh, hopefully approve a plan at our meeting on the 23rd, if not on the 30th. We understand that uh, folks are anxious to, to get things uh, finalized to the point where you can make plans. Um, but uh, I, I can tell you that even once we approve a plan, um, you know, things are gonna, things are gonna keep changing. So uh, if you, uh, for folks who may not be familiar with it on the district website, there's a large yellow box that says have referred opening 2021. And that has a variety of uh, resources regarding the reopening process. Uh, there's a list of uh, the organizations that we've been collaborating with uh, and their uh, recommendations. There's a list of communications from the superintendent. Uh, there's a list of school board presentations uh, and identification of the members of the task force within the district that are working on uh, putting together recommendations for the board. So uh, the health and safety of our students and our staff is paramount. Um, you know, that goes, goes without saying. But you know, this is, uh, it's not gonna be an easy road. Uh, we will we'll do the best we can uh, and we'll rely on uh, the expertise of uh, the folks at the, at both our, our, our superintendent and staff, but also uh, folks at the Delaware County IU, uh, at the Chester County Department of Health, which uh, has assumed a health department role for Delaware County. Um, and we are uh, also looking at what comes out of the Pennsylvania Department of Education, the governor's office, uh, and what comes out uh, uh, at the federal level. Uh, although I must say that there's uh, some of the federal, uh, federal recommendations are uh, not being as well received by the rep, by the administration as they might be, and uh, it remains to be seen uh, what ultimately is going to come out of CDC. So, uh, I would say stay tuned. I mean, I know we're you know the community is engaged, and we appreciate your comments, and we uh, will look. For, I'm sure we will be hearing from many members of the public, uh, both. Uh, via email as things proceed and certainly uh, at our board meetings uh, for the next several weeks. So thank you for that. Larry, excuse me, before you move on, um, we received a comment or a question in the chat function. Do you mind just letting everybody know um, that I don't know that we can answer questions throughout the meeting, um, but you can certainly send us an email and we'll get to it at the next meeting. I don't have anything at, at present, but uh, we, we can uh, respond to these uh, in writing. And I think what Mr. Fleischer said that, you know, people can continue to email uh, and we will, you know, comments emailed for the board meeting will be read as Ms. Deacon read them tonight if people wish to do that. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Ari. Okay, the next item on the agenda, uh, superintendent's remarks. Dr. Rushi. I'll go right to- You're muted. Ms. Mathers. Sorry about that. Um, my remarks I'll make a little bit deeper into the into the agenda. Um, this evening, uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Smathers, uh, who serves at Children's Hospital as their System Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Uh, what is also wonderful for us is that Sarah is a parent uh, of elementary children within in our school district. Uh, she reached out to the district, you know, offered to have a conversation if there were questions that we have, if there are any of the resources that she has available to her that could help us. Uh, she's been very generous with, you know, with her time uh, and offering to provide uh, any information, any type of guidance. 
So she was willing to join us this evening, make a few remarks, uh, you know, about instruction um, in schools, uh, and then she's willing to, you know, take a couple of questions uh, from the board this evening. So, uh, Sarah, I will turn it over to you now. Okay, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, great. Um, so, as Dr. Rishi mentioned, I am the System Director of Infection Prevention and Control at CHOP, but um, more importantly, I am a parent. And I do plan to send my children back to Chatham Park to start their second and fourth grade this fall, as long as the Department of Public Health um, says that it's safe to do so based on the community transmission that we have at that time. We've already talked about school and how school is going to look different this fall and how important it is for them to wear their masks to protect their friends and their teachers and being extra careful about things like hand hygiene, as well as not touching their faces. I was really pleased to see the have a firm return to school plan had a risk-based approach with um, options to adjust based on community transmission. So when there's less spread in the community, then there, there's more opportunity for in-person, safe in-person learning. Whereas when cases or if cases increase, then looking at a hybrid model or online only learning will be really important. And we have to have this flexibility because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID-19. We can see in the South that there's been a rise in cases that's happened before school has started down there um, and, and seems to be based on different risk behaviors happening in, in young adults. But we um, don't have a vaccine. So this is a very different world that we're living in and we need to have the flexibility for the safety of our students and teachers to adjust based on what's happening in our own community. I really believe that school is critical for our children's emotional and cognitive development. As a parent, I saw the toll on my children when they could not go to school. And I worried not being an educator if I was providing um, enough support for their learning, if they were on track, was I doing enough? And for areas in Pennsylvania where our cases are low and have remained low, I believe the benefits of in-person learning far outweigh the risks of returning to school. As an infection prevention professional, I know that we cannot eliminate risk, but there are a number of steps we can take to make school safer for our children, for our teachers, and for our staff. The current data is telling us that children may be a lower risk of transmission um, and have a lower risk of severe disease. With all the data emerging about the virus, we do have to be cautious. This is the first time in 100 years that we've had a pandemic like this, and we don't know exactly what we're gonna learn in the fall. But I anticipate we're going to have to pivot probably a few times as we go back to school, as we hear from educators and parents and students about what is working and what isn't working. In the past six months that I've worked on this pandemic, that has been um, the one constant has been changed. We are constantly learning, adjusting, um, getting new information, and we're creating guidelines based off of what we know about respiratory viruses and what we're learning about SARS-CoV-2. But we need to be flexible as we learn new information. We have to adjust in order to keep everyone safe. So change is, change is gonna happen. It's gonna be part of this process. The Haverford Plan contained four important infection prevention strategies that I wanted to emphasize. They're not, they're all important, but taken together, it's the additive effect that's going to have an impact and reduce risk. So we really need to do all of them and commit to all of them. The first one is screening, and I heard this in the comments. This is a shared responsibility between schools and parents. The schools are going to have to enforce sick policy with their staff, and parents will likewise have to be um, have to have a low threshold for their kids staying home when when ill. We've all been there as parents. Are they sick enough to go to school this year? The answer is yes. Keep them at home. They are too sick to go to school. Um, the second part of the plan to reopen was hygiene, and I always teach that hand hygiene is the single most critical infection prevention measure you can do, and it's the easiest. And I'm really excited to see that hand hygiene is gonna be built into the day. Um, and I hope that stays post COVID as children need access to hand hygiene. Um, when they come in from to school, when they get off the bus and go into school, I really want them cleaning their hands before and after they eat, after they come in from recess, um, and after they use the bathroom. These are all important times and our, our children need to have access to be able to either wash their hands or hand sanitize. In terms of disinfecting surfaces, I, I may be a little controversial here, but I, um, we can't clean our way out of this pandemic. And so we have to have a common sense approach to cleaning. And as an infection preventionist, I would love to say with unlimited resources, clean everything all the time. 
Unfortunately, our supply chain has had a devastating impact and we are not getting the supplies that we need and we would we would shortly run out of supplies if we were to take that approach. So we really need to have a common sense approach, disinfect things at the end of the day, take a look at cleaning additional things, high, high touch surfaces, places like nurses offices um, where sick people will be going, the lunch table where people are eating. So think about those as being, um, you know, having additional cleaning, but really need to be concerned about our supply chain with that one. The third approach is distancing and physical distancing has very strong evidence to support its effectiveness in reducing transmission. You heard um, from Dr. Rubin in the Child Policy Lab that they recommend physical distancing uh, with a goal of six feet. And I know the Haverford Plan uh, said at least three feet, which is the distance recommended by the World Health Organization. I still encourage that six feet is the goal. When we can't reach that goal, we do need to employ other infection prevention practices. And so this happens in the hospital. We have clinical care in which we can't, you know, if we're providing care to a patient in a patient's room, we can't all stay six feet away from each other. Um, and there's times in the offices when you're training somebody that you're, you're within six feet. So that's when mask use, universal mask use is very important, having both people masked. It's also important that we face the desk in a configuration where they're not face-to-face. -face. So potentially, you know, looking straight ahead or even angled away from each other is gonna be important. Um, potentially partitions, if that's an option, um, but really need to consider that we have to use other risk mitigation strategies if we cannot achieve that six feet. Um, I'm really pleased to see the use of indoor space referenced on the opening plan. I think that will allow greater physical separation and increased ventilation, which has been shown to reduce risk of transmission. Um, and, and gratefully, we have a lot of outdoor space that could be optimized. Masking was the last prevention strategy I wanted to talk about. And recently our state mandated masking for everybody who's over two years of age. And this means our children are gonna to have to wear masks to school. Our children are important members of society and because COVID-19 is here to stay, it is very important to socialize them to masking and to normalize masking. They need to understand that masking is their way of protecting their friends, their teachers, those around them. and. Masking decreases the droplet transmission from both asymptomatic as well as pre-symptomatic individuals. And so that's how we're gonna protect everyone in the schools is by ensuring that we are compliant with masking. Enforcing masking, I know I have a seven-year-old, it's gonna take reminders, um, but I will tell you over the course of this pandemic, they've gotten better and better at it. Um, and, and hopefully when I send my kids in, um, they'll, you know, the teachers will notice that they've had some training and how to wear masks. Um, and so that's something we could do as parents before school starts. I do wanna address the current Pennsylvania guidelines that recommend mask or face shield as a face covering. The CDC and the Child Policy Lab are still recommending face masks over face shields. There are special circumstances where face shields are optimal, such as with hearing impaired children. Um, and there's some literature that the face shield may be as effective as masking, particularly if it's long enough and wide enough. Um, but that data is, isn't definitive at this time. And so I would just caution that we consider the face shield as an additive to masking um, in order to protect the eyes and not a replacement for masks. Um, and I would continue to, to watch this as evidence evolves. I also wanted to mention that just as I'm not an educator, I do not expect our teachers to be infection preventionists. And so um, that's why I, I wrote a letter and I, and I talked to Dr. Rushi and, and other members um, and friends that anything I can do to help, there are other members in the community that have infection prevention experience as well that I'm sure would be happy to help. Um, but I'd like to see our teachers have training prior to school starting so that they know about infection prevention practices, they know how to safely wear their PPE, um, and they know about infection prevention strategies. And I think that'll be really, really important for their comfort level as well as the success. Um, and just finally, as we send our children to school this fall, I've been preparing my kids by talking about ways to keep ourselves healthy and to protect those around us. I think they found it very reassuring to know what they can do against COVID-19 with so many things out of their control that these were ways they could, they could help. Um, and having had several months of experience with changing guidelines um, and evolving data around the virus, I know for certain that we will learn things when the kids go back to school and we will have to change and adjust and pivot as we learn that information in order to make sure we're doing what's safest for our children and our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I also know that Sarah did um, mention that uh, and this came up a little bit earlier, your colleagues are actually looking at 
some type of resource that could be shared with parents and adults talking with children you know, uh, about COVID, about their return to school uh, and how to normalize some of that and has offered to share that with us as well. Yes. That's great. Questions from the board. I see Dave has his hand up. Hi there. First of all, I want to thank you very much for taking your time out to come here and chat with us about this. We're, we're trying to get as much input from um, doctors and professionals such, such as yourself. So I certainly appreciate it. I had one very um, specific question about masks. Masks typically are, you know, I wear one to protect you and, you know, vice versa. Is there any particular mask? I mean, one of the things that will be asked about from parents, I'm sure, is what kind of mask should I buy? Is a cloth mask good enough? Is a bandana good enough? I, I, I just saw a news report um, this afternoon about certain kinds of masks that have a 60%, you know, stops 60% of particles, others go up to 90. Um, and, and also would that change between our students and teachers? Teachers are the ones who are, and, and faculty, are those who would be more at risk of transmission. And 95 masks are difficult to provide for all of them, but right. what would you, I mean, what would be recommendation for types of masks to both students and for faculty? Yeah, so that's a great question. I would not recommend N95s for non-healthcare workers. Um, you have to have special training in order to be able to wear them. Um, uh, they don't properly fit. That you're not actually adding any level of protection. They're also very hard to breathe through and very uncomfortable. You've seen pictures of healthcare workers with bruising around their faces for having to wear those for extended period of periods of time. So I would not recommend that. If, if I was a teacher, particularly with young children where they have um, probably less compliance and, and less um, you know, good hygiene practices, I would probably be wearing a mask with a face shield over it. Um, I'm actually going to start doing that on my, ride, my SEPTA rides um, starting on Monday. Um, I'm adding eye protection. And I think that um, for, for the other question about masking, the the one mask I would not recommend are the ones where you see the, the expiratory valves. So that just allows all of your air to come out of the mask, um, which actually doesn't protect anyone. So um, they're being sold as very breathable masks, but they actually um, aren't, aren't protection for others around you. So would not wear those. Um, cloth masks, I think for our children, it's gonna be important that the masks are comfortable or they're going to take them off. So I think comfort's gonna be a big piece of that. Um, right now, in terms of the supply chain, I think cloth masks are our option right now. Um, you know, in other countries, they do have more medical grade masks that they can give out to, to their citizens, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, and so I would use the cloth masks that are comfortable for our children. Okay, and then I'm just, just one quick, uh, just to clarify, for teachers, face shields and, and, cloth, and cloth masks, I would assume, would be or just face shield, would, 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 would face shields be, face shields not protection, would that be sufficient or should they also wear a mask under the face shield? I would wear both if okay. I were a teacher, okay. I would. Thank you. Next up, Laura. Hey, Sarah. Um, thank you for coming to talk to us. This has been really helpful. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I had two questions for you. One was about school buses and transportation. Um, do you have, I mean, I'm sure you've read the plan. Do you have any comments on, on transportation and safety of transportation? Mm -hmm. So I can tell you what we did um, at the hospital. We are transporting people from parking lots. to. So I had to help with some shuttle arrangements and everyone is masked. And um, so the riders have to, it's mandatory that they have a mask when they get on and we stagger seating. So you're, you have a person and then no, not a person and then a person and then the next row, the people are offset so that you're not directly behind somebody. You're not achieving um, greater than six feet, but you're also not on the transportation for very long and you're wearing a mask, which is how you um, kind of add those other infection prevention measures. And then I would do cleaning as well, um, ensure that we're, we're cleaning after people ride the bus. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my other question was about um, specifically young children wearing masks in elementary schools where there might not be air conditioning. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And that to me is a little concerning um, just because it does get really hot in wearing a mask and then um, they, you know, there might be breathing issues or something like that. Do you have any recommendations about that? Yeah, I, I think, that? yeah, I think that'll be something good for our environmental engineers to help us weigh in on. Is there anything that we can do in, in those, those schools? Because we do want to increase ventilation and optimize ventilation as much as we possibly can. Um, and so what are, what are some other options that we can do in order to create some cross ventilation in those spaces, which would also make it more comfortable. Um, and so I think environmental engineers would be really helpful in, in doing an evaluation for that. Okay, great, thank you. Mm-hmm. Kristen? Hi, hey, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for sharing your expertise. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, one is, um, do you think that students and staff should get tested before the beginning of the school year prior to going back to school? I do not re recommend testing for asymptomatic individuals. Um, and so without uh, an exposure risk or symptoms, then um, it, it's very difficult to interpret those tests when they come back positive. Um, in addition, you, um, you could have a false sense of security if they're negative, you could still go on to develop symptoms and disease. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question is, what would the best approach be to take if a positive case or cases are identified within the school community? Yeah, I, so I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm hopeful that our um, Chester County folks will be helping with contact tracing. Um, and I see a nod. Um, so the, I think what's gonna be important to think about is this concept of cohorting. Um, students and so you don't have a lot of intermingling so if you do have somebody come down you know in in your child's third grade classroom it'll be confined to that classroom rather than having the students switching classrooms i know my daughter had went to someplace else for math um, last year and so it had different students in that class i think we might need to rethink that um, so that you have smaller circles and pods of people so that you can contain the virus if you were to have a case Okay. Thanks. Um, I think there's one more question here. Um, so this is more pie in the sky hypothetical, but if we were able to make our decisions um, strictly based on the health of students, staff, and families, um, so taking the economy and all other factors out of it, what would your recommendation be for going back to school this year? It would be the same. I Looking at the community transmission we have right now in our area, I am... Um, I am secure that we can send, I would say, I'm going to send my children back to school in the fall and um, with the infection prevention practices and strategies. Um, I don't think school is going to look the same. We, we have to go back looking different with masks, with, um, you know, less interactions, with greater distancing, you know, less hugging and high-fiving. Um, but I, I, those are what keeps us safe. Um, you know, we've worked in the hospital with, with thousands of people for the past few months at, with universal masking. Um, and once that happened, we really decreased our employee to employee exposures. So I'm very secure that using these infection prevention strategies will reduce risk. And I, I, I just think that the benefit of online, of um, in-person instruction for, for my age group in particular, second and fourth grade, just far it outrages the risk with the current transmission that we're having in, in our county. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Antoinette. Yeah, hi. Um, again, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I also just have a, a couple uh, quick questions. So can you just talk a little bit about um, the physical distancing and the difference in the importance of physical difference in, physical distancing between like staff, for example, and, um, and the students, um, mm -hmm. based on what you were saying earlier about, you know, the lower transmission rates of, um, of younger children as compared with adults. Yes. So I, I think that, um, I, I hope that I'm understanding your question correctly, but teachers interacting with teachers, was that your, part of your question? Yes. Right. So I, I think one thing that we need to be really cautious about is meal times. So times when you have to take off your mask 
in order to eat are going to be times of increased risk and transmission. And so that is when that physical distancing of at least six feet um, is, is really crucial um, because you're going to be eating and you may excel drop, droplets when you're doing that. You don't have your mask on. I think, um, you know, in-person meetings, you're going to need to look at rooms that um, and probably reduced attendance. Um, you know, and adults can do what we're doing right now a lot easier than small children can. Um, and so using the virtual um, ways to communicate with with teacher to teacher interactions and then the other infection prevention practices of mask use and and face protection um, with I've been thinking a lot about teacher to student interactions, especially with my, my, my little ones. Um, you know, sometimes they, they need a hug or they need, they need touch or they need something. And that's when I worry that we're, you know, it's gonna be hard for teachers to not do those things. Um, and so how do we prepare, prepare them to, to comfort a child without, without touching? Um, if they do have to touch, that's why the mask and, and the face protection are gonna be really important and the access to hand hygiene afterwards. Um, and so that's where I, I talk about this layered approach. It's all of these things taken together so that when you lose one, you still have the other ones helping um, sustain the protection. Thanks. And then um, another question I had was, you know, some districts um, your, or um, states even have proposed schedules if, if they're going to do a hybrid model that there are, you know, two groups and each attends two days a week. And then one, there's a whole school day where no one goes into school because they just do cleaning. Right. Um, and so I, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, given um, that you said probably disinfecting is not the, um, the main way to fight this virus and given the importance of having our students in school as much as possible. Yes, you know, I, I've thought about that from, um, I, I know my family's in Michigan and that's the model that they've taken. My worry is that that means my children are having two days of school a week. The, the online learning was not um, the same. And um, in particular for my son, who was a, an extrovert and um, really benefits from that in-person learning. So I think that's that's the risk, right? We're, we're taking two days away from their, three days away from their education each week. Um, so we're cutting their, their education by two thirds over the course of the year. Um, so so that's, that's my concern as a parent. Um, I, I do think, you know, I, I like cleaning, I'm an infection preventionist, but I just worry that, you know, we have to keep in mind that our hands get dirty and then we touch things. So we can clean it and a minute later, five people are going to touch it and it's going to be dirty again. So we really have to think about, yes, we need to clean, but we also need to clean our hands and we need to wear our masks and we need to keep our distance. Um, and I, I think those measures are more important, um, taken all together with a good cleaning program, um, you know, and making sure that it's a quality cleaning that happens every day. Right. Okay. Um, well, th again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Ari. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for coming tonight and spending so much quality time with us. And thank you, Dr. Rushi and Haverford School District Administration for giving you tonight's uh, platform to address the community as well as the board. One question. You haven't talked about temperature screening. And there are some new messages coming out from the medical community around temperature screening not being a really good indicator for a possible infection. Could you please address that since it's not included in your four strategies that you have highlighted for us tonight? Yes, and perhaps you see my bias in that. Um, so we, we've taken a good look at the temperature screening um, and, and the risk benefits. And, and I will say, I, I think people who are employing temperature screenings are doing it more as an optic. Um, it, it provides um, a sense of security for, for people, um, but there's no, there's no evidence that it actually catches people who are, who are sick. Um, and so ECRI Institute actually looked at the quality of the inf evidence on the infrared scanners. Um, they're actually not very good for checking temperatures. There are things that change the way your temperature is. If you come in from a hot day, you've been running around outside, you have an elevated temperature. If 
if you're bundled from the cold, you can come in and have an elevated temperature. So now we're having false positives potentially. Um, and you can have many negatives in people who have other symptoms of COVID. Um, and so I don't think that temperature screening is worth the investment. Um, I think really looking at your screening procedures and enforcing your sick policy um, and your expectations around the symptoms that people cannot have when they're at work or at school are, are the greater you know, bang for the buck. Bridget? Hi, thank you so much. This has been a really informative presentation. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about you're comfortable with our current level of community transfer. And I know there's people who track the data and, and watch the county level information. Um, could you just give us some kind of parameters of when that community transfer might elevate to a level that would change the um, strategy that's been described here tonight? Yeah, I think if we were to see an ongoing upward incline, um, then that we should start to get cautious and start planning for, for you know, when we're going to pivot. Um, I think it's a really good idea to pick maybe what that cutoff will be. Um, and perhaps the, the Department of Health already has that embedded within their green, yellow, and red zones. Um, I, I think that if we were in Arizona, I know if we were in Arizona, we would not be having the same conversation. I would not be saying I'm comfortable um, with us going back to school, but but we're not. And, and you know, our data looks a lot different, um, but I do think we need to track it and we need to use it to prepare for our next step. Other questions from the board? Sarah, I'd just like to echo the thanks uh, from my fellow board members, thank you very much for for your time this evening. And I've, uh, I guess one one concern that I hope you could comment on is, um, you know, what do we what do we recommend for our older teachers? Yeah, you know, I think that um, people probably need to be able to do their own risk assessments. Um, they need to be armed with the knowledge of these are all the things that we're providing to protect you. Um, and those are the same things that work whether you're 66 or 25. Um, you know, masks, face shields, hand hygiene, um, th those are the same things I would recommend to, to my grandma and, and to my mom. But I think that for some people that's not gonna be okay for them. And so I, I do think that the district needs to accept that some people's personal risk assessments um, may they may want to opt out um, particularly if they're immunocompromised in some way in addition to being in a certain age category so i, I do think that that you know in addition to the education um, that that there may be some people who are are not comfortable in the midst of a pandemic coming back to work well i, I thank you very much and i have a feeling we may see you again <laughs> happy to help yes sarah thank you so much for your time this evening Welcome. Next item on our agenda is the health and safety plan for return to athletics. Mr. Donahue and uh, Ms. Patterson. Hello, everyone. If, if, if Dr. Smathers wants to just continue, <laughs> she can continue with our plan. Uh, but it is good to hear that, uh, that the plan is uh, I did not write down anything since she started talking and, and I'll just go over the highlights and the, and the plan and how it works. And you'll, you'll hear some redundancy from what she said, which is, which makes me feel a whole lot better uh, about the plan. Um, and then I'm here with Ms. Patterson tonight. I'll, I'll do the talking just so we don't have to jump back and forth. Uh, Ms. Patterson is retiring September 1st. So she's the smartest person in Haverford Township. Uh, by far, uh, but she's here and, and she obviously uh, had a, uh, worked on the plan and had a ton of input. So our plan is for the voluntary preseason sports only, okay, uh, for the next few weeks. And then in a few weeks, we'll, we'll give you a, a final plan for, for sports moving forward, um, which, which will be very similar to this plan, but we, wanted, we didn't want to get we didn't want to go eight weeks out 
There are some districts who put a plan into place that goes all the way through August, but we wanted to get a few weeks under our belt and make sure what we're doing is the right thing. And th since things are changing so frequently, we didn't feel an eight week plan would be in our best interest. So our plans on the uh, PA Department of Education template uh, and on the top of the plan is our summary uh, of what we're going to be doing. Uh, there is some redundancy to the plan. Uh, on the top of the plan, you'll also see a form that we're using. Uh, we may update the form even, you know, tonight or tomorrow night based on your, tonight or tomorrow morning based on your input. Um, so it's a screening form. And we are going with the four components that Dr. Smathers uh, just, just spoke about. Okay, so we are looking to, uh, for safety and prevention through masking, social distancing, hygiene, which incorporates cleaning and sanitizing, uh, and screening and health monitoring. Um, so there are four categories and the plan focuses around those four categories. And I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, communicated them uh, to the coaches and how we're gonna communicate them uh, to, to the general public. Uh, our plan is on the P PA Department of Education state template. It's, it's the same form uh, that's used to open schools. Um, how we got started was as soon as uh, the state went green or our county went green uh, in June, the, uh, the sports enthusiasts uh, jumped right on that. They couldn't wait to get out there uh, and, and practice and play. And some districts did start already, okay? And we're one of the last ones in Delaware County to start, but we didn't feel we were ready, okay? We wanna make sure that our kids are safe. Uh, we're not succumbing to peer pressure. Uh, we know our, our student athletes will be ready for when the season starts, but we wanted to take our time. So we gathered a lot of information from all the different sources, CDC, uh, the REL uh, Mid-Atlantic Study, the PIAA. Uh, we used uh, Chester County started a couple weeks ago. Um, so we used their templates. We used, uh, we looked at different parts of the state that already started, um, who were green uh, before Dower County. And then Ms. Patterson does numerous phone calls with other athletic directors. And then the Central League athletic directors have had a few meetings uh, since since we turned green and right before we were green also um, to look at the best way to implement uh, the plans. And then from there, we went through our own central office, our own facilities, uh, Jared Gugliemi, uh, Dr. Rushi, Ms. Battistelli, Ms. Christensen. So we went, you know, Ms. Saxa, we talked about, we're not only talking about opening schools, but we talked about uh, how athletics would work uh, we, we also started our discussions with the middle school uh, to, you know, see what the concerns are because we are a little bit landlocked and we need to uh, make sure that we're sharing our facilities and social distancing at the same time. Uh, so safety is our first priority. We want to make sure the students are physically and mentally ready. So I was glad to hear Dr. Smathers uh, put the mental aspect of school into the plan also. Uh, and then physically, some of the students uh, have, have done started their club teams and whatnot, but um, physically they, they just haven't been as active as they normally are. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the plan is when the coaches start, we're not going full force next week and people are getting hurt or anything like that. So, and then we wanted to make sure uh, the plan and the communications to the coaches uh, incorporates positive peer pressure, okay? Especially with uh, ado young adolescents, we do wanna make sure they're wearing their masks. We do wanna make sure um, they know all the precautions, okay? And we do, we do uh, you know, we tell them the precautions over and over again, but they're starting to become young adults and making their own decisions. So we wanted to make sure that was a, uh, the primary focus of the coaches is, to make sure they're safe and the uh, athletics uh, and, and the uh, conditioning is secondary to, to making sure everyone's safe. So what we did was we met with the coaches yesterday uh, on a Zoom call and went over 
uh, the preliminary plans and the, you know, the four components of the plan and how that would work. Um, we are not doing thermometer screening, um, but there will be a daily check-in uh, with the coaches, a checklist uh, that the coach, the coach has to fill out in a one-to-one -one communication with the athlete um, and check off uh, different items. And that's included in the plan. Uh, I believe it's, it's on about page seven. Um, and then we just had a discussion with the coaches. So a lot of great ideas came out of, you know, simple things that, that, you know, besides the masking and the, and the sat, you know, sanitizing, how do you do practice without using a ball? Okay. How do you do, um, how do you do cross country and social distance, you know, cause normally a lot of the training in, in cross country is you're running with a partner or you're running next to the coach or, you know, so there's a lot of different things that, that they discussed. Uh, we have a real good rapport, the fall coaches with one another. So they discussed, and then they decided on who would use what, what parking lot. Okay. And then some of the bones of the meeting is we're going to practice eight to 12 during the week. Okay. No captain's practice. Um, so eight to 12, we want to practice in two different locations. We're going to be at Manoa school for soccer and we're going to be at, ha at the, at the high school. We don't have the track right now, uh, but we're going to be at the high school. So eight to 12, we feel that's a real easy way for Ms. Patterson and the, and the administrators to monitor what's going on. Not all the teams are practicing because we have a lot of students who play club sports. So they don't need to do a preseason practice or they'll have a small group of students uh, practicing. So not a huge concern uh, with, with some of the teams. And then we wanted to keep uh, obviously our number under 250. And our cross country team has uh, about 120 runners between the boys and the girls. And our football team has about 80 students. So they had to do groupings. Um, so their numbers are low. Um, so they're going to do two different groups. Um, the cross country team is going to stretch you out front. Uh, so different things like that. And then um, Coach Gale went to Radner's practice yesterday to see how Radner is running their football practices just to get another point of view. Um, so a lot of those ideas were generated through the meeting. Miss uh, Patterson went over all the protocols. The high school administrators were there, so we're all on the same page. And then moving forward, uh, from here, we're going to make any changes to the plan uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll start tonight and tomorrow morning. And then uh, after it gets approved, if it gets approved, we will uh, post on the website. Uh, we're going to include it in the, uh, my weekly email to the parents. Uh, the coaches know to expect something tomorrow. Uh, they know we were presenting tonight at the meeting and that we would give uh, them your feedback and uh, make adjustments as needed. And then in three weeks, we'll just update the plan as needed, uh, you know, depending on where we are uh, with the state and all. And uh, hopefully things, things go well. And then if, um, if there, and then Dr. Smathers talked a little bit about pods too. And that's one of the aspects the coaches are, are going to do is group, group students together um, just so in case someone gets sick, we will know who they primarily work with. Um, and then we'll be able to, to identify them. So that was one of the, uh, discussion points with the coaches also. So that's kind of the quick version. The, the actual plan is 23 pages um, and it follows the template set forth uh, by the state. Is the public able to see this plan? Um, I, I can see it when I'm in board docs and there's a, an attachment. I'm just not sure what the public version looks like for any of our attendees tonight. The public has not seen this yet. So we were going, we were going to post it on the website so they can see it exactly how, how you have it. Cause we're talking about a plan they can't see or, or review along with us. It's a little discombobulated if you ask me right now. 
It is, it's available on like what became available today in terms of the board agenda for the, has that on there. So I mean, people could have, you know, have seen it um, after tonight is when it's supposed to be posted. If it's, once it's approved is when it's supposed to be posted on the website. And I, I know from interactions, like the coaches have been interacting with Ms. Patterson and Mr. Dunahee asking, you know, when are things going to start? And they've been in touch, the kids know uh, that there's a potential that they would be beginning next week. So if I heard you correctly, anyone attending the meeting tonight that's looking at board docs and listening to the meeting cannot see the 23 page document or they can? They can, they can. They can, yes. okay. As it is now, yes. Okay. Bridget? Hi, um, just a couple things. I just wanted to point out. So this is a difference with, um, in the past, the preseason was largely captain's practices as I understand it, or my kids participated in. So after the approval of this plan, um, there would not be such a thing as captain's practices this summer and they would meet with the coach who um, performs these safety checks and monitors the spacing and hygiene and all that. Yes, they can't, we can't do captain's practices as we have done in the past. Okay. Um, I, I know this plan is focused on the preseason of sports. Um, I know another group that is probably getting together soon and will be spending a lot of time outside and practicing their formations is the band. Yes. Are any aspects of this plan planned to be um, guiding the, the marching bands preseason activity. Yes, yes. I spoke to Mr. Hart and he already is developing a plan. Um, they start a couple weeks later. So uh, he's developing a plan. He'll be using this template too. Uh, so they'll have, you know, similar in, in some ways. Uh, and then he already started gathering uh, different uh, programs. Uh, Phoenixville, I believe Radnor, maybe Marple, he started gathering. And uh, I spoke, I had a meeting, a Zoom meeting today with the Bob's parents uh, also. And we'll probably present that uh, not next week, but the week after, and then, and then get it started. And it's very similar in template and in, in protocol. Mm -hmm. um, and again, some uh, places have already started marching band, believe it or not. Uh, in different parts of the state. Um, and just one other question about the um, the screening tool that's used is, is it contemplated that that would um, be collecting data and then there's a process for kind of reporting out or using it for contact tracing? Yep. So they collect data every day and they have to give the, the form right away to uh, Ms. Patterson. So any I don't know if the word's abnormality or any concern we would address right away. Um, the good news is Ms. Patterson, myself, and a couple of the other administrators are here the whole month of July. So we have a lot of support uh, for this, for the, uh, you know, for athletics and for the band when they start to. And Ms. Wiedemann, if there was anything on, you know, on there uh, that with the Chester County Health Department being our health authority, uh, if anyone does test positive or that, that's who we, we contact them and they guide us through in what to do. And the coaches have been very heavy on if you're not feeling well or there's something going on, please do not come. This is preseason. This is not life or death. And, and they're sending the right message. Right now they're sending the right message that, you know, there's more important things than than athletics right now. And, and they're doing a good job of, of the, the kids understand the method and, and having uh, a, a, a son who plays on one of the teams and having neighbors who play, it, they've been getting consistent messages when I, when I ask uh, different students uh, about what they're hearing. Okay, good, thank you. Kristen? Yeah, um, so Mr. Donaghy, I was wondering, what is the plan to communicate the athletics plan 
including the signature page that parents need to sign off on by Monday. Um, so we're looking at a 713 start. Today is 79. Yes. And we're about to enter the weekend. Yeah. So um, they they have already previewed that a plan will be developed with uh, a form that needs to be signed and returned. And they've also started to um, all the teams that are starting, not every team starting next week. So next week we have football, uh, cross country. Um, we have one of the two soccer teams. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's maybe four teams, uh, but it's a lot of students. So they also are encouraging the, the PIAA physical form is not due until the uh, athletic starts, but we are encouraging them to get that, uh, form done as soon as possible also. So the teams that are starting have already started the communication. Um, and they just said, you know, it, it'll be any time, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks we're getting going. So be prepared. And, you know, if, if there's anything going on now to let us know. And then tomorrow we're going to be sending hopefully tomorrow we'll be sending out the official plan or whatever we start we'll send out the official plan uh to those to the uh to the coaches and if we need to we can get the coaches back together for a zoom meeting too and they and we brought that up on wednesday um and is there a plan to create an executive summary of this that would be more accessible to parents in the community um i mean a 23 page document is great from the perspective of the district and for planning and implementation purposes, but I just would like for there to be a more accessible document. Sure. Yeah, we could do that. Myself, Ms. Patterson, and I can definitely do that. And then we're going to, I'm, I've already had to start my weekly communications just because there's so much going on with, with everything at the high school. So we can include that too, uh, in the, in the communications. It is, it is a lot. It is a lot. Um, and just another question about the screening checklist. Um, I was looking at the language that talks about athletes um, needing to report healthy. Let me see if I can get you a page number here. Um, I think it's uh, page eight. Under athlete's responsibility, right? Oh, yeah, athlete's reason. responsibility, okay. Yeah, sorry, there aren't page numbers on mine. Um, it just says athletes will be healthy when reporting to each workout. Any athlete who exhibits fever, chills, nausea, sore throat, headaches, shortness of breath, and any other symptoms of COVID-19 are prohibited from participating in a workout. And then it goes on to say that that needs to be documented on the checklist. Um, I just noticed on the checklist, though, that all of those explicitly stated symptoms aren't actually on the checklist. Yes, we are going to add them. Uh... I already corresponded with uh, Dr. Rushi about that. So we're going to add them to the checklist um, and they'll, they'll have to say yes or no to them also. Great. Um, so in terms of the checklist, are we doing this by paper? Is this something that can be done digitally um, just for you know, better well, record keeping purposes? The checklist we're starting on paper. Now, okay. as we go to the real season, mm -hmm. uh, we may go electronic. We were discussing that because it's more teams and more students. And, and this preseason workout is generally upperclassmen. So we have freshman teams and, you know, that we're going to add in, uh, in August. So, uh, we will be able to handle it on paper and then, um, but we need to, we need to do it electronically because there's too many kids, uh, once, once the year starts. Okay. Um, and just one other question. Um, so I'm just thinking about in terms of sports, um, male sports, female sports, I just want to make sure I know we're going to be trying to space out and use, um, be creative about our space use within the district and in the community. Um, I just want to make sure that girls are given the same priority of, of quality um, practice space as our, our male athletes are. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our girls and boys soccer, both in Manila, our, our cross country uh, girls and boys team uh, practices together. Right now, for the uh, the volunteer workouts, we don't have the CREC. We're working on getting that. Normally, we don't have it at this point in the summer. So th that's the only concern right now because we have a field out back, but it isn't. It's not level. You know, the the, the actual ground isn't level, and it's not turf. So they're used to playing on turf, and now that and they usually do preseason 
on the turf, but we don't have turf because of the new track. So they'll have, they'll have the turf. Hopefully the track gets done on time and they'll have the turf for the, uh, the real preseason. Um, so that's the only uh, concern right now. And, and also volleyball will be uh, using the parking lot. They're not available to go into the gym. So they're going to do some individual skill work with just the ball in the back parking lot. So the teams are aware. Uh, field hockey is also in a summer league. So they are playing on turf and have practiced at some location. I'm not sure where, but they, they are playing a little bit. So they have time also and are more concerned about conditioning than they are stick skills at this point. Got it. Thank you both. Yep. Dave? All right, well, first of all, thank you um, to, to both of you for giving us some of the info tonight. I, I have one question, and maybe, um, Mr. Donahue, you can clarify this for me. You said that this plan has, been, it has not yet been given to parents and coaches until tonight? It, or it, no, it was given to the coaches, and the coaches previewed what was in the plan. Um, you know, at, at, and the four major components, they, they previewed with the students, but they didn't give them this actual plan because it's not approved yet. And, you know, we wanted you obviously to have it before they did, but with this whole, you know, the whole COVID situation, we're on such a time crunch that, you know, it's, it's, everything's moving so quickly. So the coaches have it, they reviewed the, the, the plans components, they reviewed you know, you're going to have to sign a form. They reviewed uh, each day you're going to check in. You have to wear masks. Um, we're going to stretch six feet apart. You know, we're not going to huddle. We're not going to high five. Like they went over all the uh, com like the components and the day to day uh, application of the plan. But they didn't say, here's the plan uh, to the students. Uh, how about to, to the um, parents? The parents have not seen the plan yet, no. Um, okay, okay, and, and, and I guess, I'll, all right. I have more to say about that later on, but um, one thing I also wanna talk about, just a couple of specifics with the plan with regards to masking. Um, there appears to be an inconsistency, maybe I, I'm, I'm, I'm misreading it, on page 17, it indicates that student athletes must wear masks to and from practices or to and from events. Yep. And then on page 22, it says, it says they must wear them to and from events and during, and during um, activities that occurs within six feet or less. So yeah, I guess my question so, is which, which one is that and what, what events wouldn't be within six feet or less well, in these sports? We're, we're, we are encouraging no, no events six feet or less, but if they have to get the team together. We're still encouraging them to be more than six feet apart. We're encouraging uh, Zoom meetings versus real meetings. But if there's a time where they have to, to, to gather the, the team up and it's less than six feet, they need to be wearing masks. So that's, that's kind of the guide for all the students. And then it's, it's kind of a guide so they don't congregate. Our worry is after practice is over, they're going to want to hang out with their friends that they haven't seen in a while. And that's going to be six feet or, you know, that would be less than six feet apart. So we don't want them congregating on the field. So if they're on the field and they're less than six feet apart, even when they're leaving, we, we want a mask on. Um, there's not many activities. Uh, we discussed that with the coaches. Um, they believe they can do all their drills and, you know, with more than six feet apart. So that we don't, we don't see that, but we wanted to put it in there as, as that's kind of the, the barometer of, of, of anytime you're six feet or less, you need to have a mask on. Okay. I, I, I would like to have that consistent then for, for both of those two sections. That's probably a small change, but it kind of makes sense. Just you have put question. on page seventeen to. Yeah, right. Just, just yeah. to just make things just make things very, very clear for everybody. Sure. The other question I had, and this is something that I'm not sure if you're able to answer, um, and I don't expect you to necessarily. I just think it should be. It's one of my concerns here is that if somebody does test positive, a student does test positive, we cannot, you know, 
due to HIPAA requirements, you can't just send out a letter saying, you know, Tina was the positive on, on, on this day. She was in the group with your student. I mean, that's not legal, quite frankly. But my question is, if somebody does test positive for this, I know that you're, it's reported from, from the student to, to the administration, the administration to Chester County CDC, or to, excuse me, to Chester County Health Department, I guess, can you, can, can you or can anybody else who might know, Dr. Rushi, I'm not sure if you're you know, aware of the, of the protocol, what then happens to alert other students who may have been around this student that, hey, you know, that they want to get tested. Within, that is all within the um, responsibility of the Chester County Health Department. They will then do contact tracing. So like, they will be asking us for information. You know, who are the other students? That this um, you know uh, youngster was near, and we'll we will be responsible to provide that information, and they will make the decision who needs to be notified. But we, as a school district, will not be notifying anybody. I know we can. No, I understand that, that that we can. That's not legal, obviously. But I just wanted to ensure that 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 would there, there's a protocol for that. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely. Also, is if somebody gets somebody gets tested, they're not they're going to practice. That's great, but it takes few days to get results from a test sometimes. You have to get, there's a difference between getting a positive test and getting a doctor to certify that. And then I, I guess- the, the Yeah, and, and if, if we've, you know, we're gonna be on high alert the next three weeks from eight to 12 o'clock. And if, if we feel we have to shut it down, you know, again, we'll just have to shut it down and until everyone's safe. We're, the student's health is the main priority and not athletics, uh, you know, and I, that might not be popular, but that's, that's like, you know, that's the way myself, Dr. Rushi, uh, Ms. Patterson, everyone's looking at this and, and the coaches too, the coaches have been great. Uh, they want to win like everybody else, but the coaches are really understanding of, of the significance of, of the next couple of weeks. Okay, and just one other quick comment here, and then I'll, I don't want to take too much time here, but um, I know too late, but um, students are being asked to bring their own water bottles, which makes yeah. a lot of sense. Knowing kids, a few of them will not. And we're, I mean, looking at the forecast, we're getting 90 degree plus temperatures. If you're wearing masks, that increases the heat. Is there any way of just providing single use water mm -hmm. bottles or something as a backstop for this? I don't want, I mean, we uh, That's the most important. You don't kids collapse and clean exhaustion out there yeah, either. So we it's, it's we do have we have water bottles in our freezer and fridges here at the school. So one precaution is if someone forgets, we can help them out. But okay. we do, we do not want to bring a cooler outside and have them diving in with their hands and grabbing water bottles. So I agree um, with that. No, I, I, we're, I we're that. good. Like you know, if he forgets, if, if they, if they live very close, we might say, go get your water bottle, uh, so tr to train them. Um, and, and that's what the preseason's for too, is to help train them. So when the real season starts, they'll, they'll be, uh, they'll be ready to go, but we do have, uh, water bottles. Um, but we're not providing them each day, but we will help people out if they need it. Okay. And now we do some, okay. Okay, thank you. That's all for it now. I thank you, Matt, but thank you. Ari? Yes, thank you. Um, hand washing, sanitizing before play. Is that, is that stated in the plan? I didn't see it. Maybe it's changed. But um, after listening to Mrs. Smathers earlier, it sounds like hand hygiene is really important. So you've got these student athletes showing up. Um, you're screening them. Is there a way to get them to hand wash and sanitize before? I think that could be important. Um, Dave just talked about heat exhaustion and hydration. There, there is a 90 degree day in the forecast for a while. I know we're working out here between eight and 12, but if we don't have any medical staff or training staff on the fields until um, the August season starts, I'm concerned about heat exhaustion protocols. Uh, I'm a University of Maryland grad and we lost a student on the football field a, a couple of years ago very traumatic yeah. and I, I know we put, uh, and I know we have a couple of, of Haverford grads on the Maryland football team now so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about heat exhaustion um, there's no locker room access there's no building access 
in the plan. There's nothing about bathroom access, I don't think, in the plan. There is, uh, yeah, the bathrooms will be uh, in, indoors in the, in the ban near the band rooms. Uh, so that's the only thing inside. There's no other indoor access. Um, but I will put hand sanitizing. It says before, during, or after sessions. I'll just clarify that. There will be hand sanitizer outside and there will be spray bottles uh, sanitizer outside too at, at each session. So we can, I'll put that in there on page 11. And if I could just echo um, a couple of the previous board members about communication around this plan. We're getting it tonight. I think we're being asked to vote on it later. Being able to give the community, uh, our coaches, our student athletes, our parents enough time to get a chance to review the plan, get familiar with the plan, fully understand it. The ramifications of the plan is going to be critical to the success of this plan. There is no room for failure. This is a one strike plan, if, if I'm correct. Correct, you are correct, yeah. And, and I don't like working this way either. It's just that the, uh, the, the, the timing and the pressure to implement. Understood, but you did mention that other districts are already plans have been adopted and they're, they're already playing. So we're one of the last ones. We, we have had some time to you know, get this before tonight, I think. All right, just so you know, some of the other districts started to practice before they had board approval. They were told they could do that as, as soon as they submitted the plan. So there are some, some of the schools in the Central League actually started before they had their school board approval. We decided not to do that and didn't think that was in the base, best interest of the safety of the students. Kristen? Yes. Um, so in light of Ms. Smathers' comments earlier about the types of masks that we should be using, I know I've seen a ton of those um, valve masks being worn, especially by runners. Um, people are out and about doing various um, physical activity. I didn't notice anywhere in our plan where we're specifying the type of masks that our students or coaches should be wearing. Um, it's, would there be a way to qualify? Um, clarify that because I do worry that the valve masks may be the most popular choice being that they're the most breathable but as Ms. Smathers said they are the least effective. Um, might we take a look at identifying and I can follow up with uh, with Ms. Smathers tomorrow as well. Might we perhaps look at maybe identifying that as something that people may not wear uh, and you know look at you know, what would be recommended in terms of the, um, not the quality, what word, like the product itself, the fabric, they make some recommendations that way, uh, in, instead of saying there has to be one specific uh, mask that people right. would wear, might that be sure. the way to address that? Thank you. Okay. Um, and I'm also wondering too, I know masks become less effective, and this would also be a question for Ms. Mathers, um, when they get wet and just given the heat, and physical activity, I know these masks are gonna get hot and sweaty. So we may also wanna recommend that students bring multiple masks to their practices. And I just wanted to note, I know this is stated in the plan, but um, just for the, the public's knowledge, this plan is only good for the green phase. If we go back into yellow or red, this all shuts down. Correct, Correct. Okay. great point. All right, thanks. Any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I would just like to highlight that in the plan, only employed staff and coaches are able to work, attend, conduct. Is that correct? Can parents hang yeah. out and watch their kids? No. Can, can volunteers show up? No, yeah. unfortunately. And, uh, you know, Hanford's a great community and we, we have college kids come back and help out and visit and we just can't do, we can't do that during these times, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate, but we, we just can't, we can't have anyone there. And um, even saying hello to the coach, we can't, we can't do that. Are, are any of the teams asking to use any equipment other than a ball or, or a stick as in field hockey? Um, what about mouth guards, uh, football helmets, that we did we did uh, discuss football helmets and we said at this time they normally have them in the preseason but we're not giving them out until the uh, real season starts we just see that as another vehicle 
to, to spread, you know, spread the disease. So whether it's, you know, CDC says it spreads the disease or not, we just don't, a kid could pick up the wrong helmet. You know, there's different scenarios that we just felt the helmets, we, we didn't need to use them at this time. So we said no to that. So no football equipment other than a football. Just, yep. And, and we are also not having any access to any of the weight room equipment. Who's in charge responsible for monitoring our plan while it's in process? Ms. Patterson and myself. The coaches are also hopefully. Yeah, the coaches and, and Mr. Guglielmi has a big hand in uh, helping us with the, with the facilities needs and, and cleaning and all that. So we've had uh, maybe five or six discussions with him since, since June. Now, since there's no medical staff or training staff, are we required to have a nurse in the building uh, around the field, one of our employees? No, and, and that is not, um, I mean, that has been the practice all along that, you know, that is not because of the pandemic or you know, we do not have our athletic trainer does not begin until August. Our nurses do are not there dur uh, during that time. Dave, you had another question? Yeah, sorry, just real quick, I'll try to be, be brief. In, in light of what Ms. Mathers mentioned to us earlier, and I, I don't know if it's Dr. or, or, or Ms. Mathers, I apologize if I got it wrong. Um, for, the, for the coaches, for the, for, for the staff out there, should we also include a recommendation for face shields and eye protection? That hasn't been uh, what we were told and we did check with other places i mean that's up i guess that's up to us to decide if we want to do that or not i don't know if that's recommended for outdoors anyway hmm. right now okay. the coaches have to wear their mask at all times okay and i guess for thinking ahead a little bit for, for some sports i'm thinking mostly football for example it's possible to put in clear shields on some of that equipment. I mean, I know that we're in preseason, right? We're not using that, that equipment. Is some thought being put towards those measures, however, for the extra layer of, of uh, protection? At this, at this time, no. Um, we're looking at doing those things to possibly open school um, and offices and, and such. So for our for purposes of our preseason, um, and quite frankly, waiting to hear uh, what PIA, PIAA is going to be recommending and others about fall sports. Um, we're not even sure how that's going to play out yet. And there is, okay, they so are having a webinar next Tuesday uh, that Ms. Uh, Patterson and I are attending. Uh, PSBA, the Pennsylvania, not PSBA, Posada, sorry, the Pennsylvania Athletic Directors and the PIAA head will be at the uh, webinar next Tuesday. Uh, it's a roundtable discussion. I don't know how much if they're going to be making decisions, but we're going to be in attendance on that. So we'll get a new plan then about the season when that starts. It's just the preseason. Yeah. Okay. Kristen, um, just another question about masking requirements. How are we enforcing this? And I ask this when the within the context of PA's recommendation or their universal masking requirements as it applies to schools. Um, I know at the very end of their recommendations, there's a caveat that says any student um, can decline wearing a mask if they have a certain health condition, which they do not need to disclose. So of course there are students who have health conditions um, who will be exempt from wearing a mask, but I also recognize that that could be um, stretched to fit the maybe thoughts or needs of other students who maybe just don't wanna wear a mask. Yeah, can we're- ask our solicitor about that, Kristen? Uh, and while we will be permitted to ask what the um, category is, like what, what is the exemption? So someone could say, you know, a health impairment or you know, religious reason, we cannot question beyond that. And we cannot deny someone either the opportunity to school or to an experience. Um, and I guess this is another council related question. What is our liability? Um, can parents sue us if um, 
COVID is contracted by a student through the preseason pre practice, or even this would extend out to school reopening. I, I will I will get a legal uh, response to you for that. Well, I won't give you, you know, my opinion. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Well, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate all your work on, on that, and uh, we'll keep our fingers and toes crossed. Take care. Next, next item on the agenda is an update on the opening of the 2020-2021 school year. Dr. Rushi. You're muted. You're muted. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Feinberg. Uh, we started um, last week with communication out to the community. Um, this was the introductory screen. Um, and I had indicated that at each one of our board members, I would, each one of our board meetings, I would take this information and update it, update it in terms of what are the decisions that we have made around each of the different scenarios uh, and how we are going to, what we are still yet to discuss uh, in terms of, of moving forward. And it all stems from the fact that, that you know, the guidance is fluid as others have mentioned er, earlier. So on July 2nd, the first communication came out tonight. Um, I'll be talking about uh, what some of the classrooms would look like uh, with a minimum of three feet of social distancing. Uh, next week, our focus will be if we go to some type of a hybrid or a split schedule, what that would entail and potentially look like. Uh, we'll have less of the administration talking and, and more question and answer uh, from the board on the 23rd. Uh, we'll make a recommendation um, of the different scenarios that have been presented. At all times, an, uh, one of the options available for families, regardless of what scenario is presented, is Haverford Online. Uh, and we're going to learn more about that next week. Uh, we'll have a presentation just on Haverford Online and what, what that entails. So we've got lots of information to share over the next three weeks um, with, you know, with, with everyone. Uh, even, and we'll, we'll go to the next slide here, Anna. even with um, the information coming out on the 2nd of uh, July, the Chester County Department of Health already updated uh, or revised the guidance that we, that we had received. Um, we know that there was um, updated guidance that came out uh, from the Pennsylvania Department of Health regarding the masking. And we have also been informed that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will be um, providing either updated guidance or guidelines to schools with the anticipated um, receipt of that information sometime next week. So again, it's, it's very fluid depending on uh, how strict the guidance is that may influence our recommendation one way or the other. It may alter uh, a plan that, you know, that we have. So we are awaiting um, that information. So our four focus areas continue, uh, and even as Ms. Mathers mentioned, our four focus areas continue to be distancing, screening, hygiene, and masking. Uh, with, the, with distancing, um, we now, we can do classroom configurations to maintain at least three feet of distancing in all of our schools. We were, la um, last week when we put this out, we knew that we could do it at the elementaries. We now have measured that out and, and actually today finished every classroom in the high school uh, where the furniture, all extraneous furniture has been removed. Desks are in there so that they can, it can be measured appropriately to ensure that we can um, open that way. If, um, we know that our buses can operate with two students per seat. And when I say they can operate, that is because in the Chester County Department of Health uh, recommendations, they are saying that you can transport, transport students to, to, to a seat. If we were to do the, you know, um, every other seat or every other, I think in a previous presentation, I had said to you a 72 passenger bus now goes down to 12 students um, on that bus. There is no way we would be able to provide transportation um, at that rate, knowing that we can put two students. So when questions come in, why I think it's okay to put two students per seat, that was not something that I said, well, two bodies will fit and let's see what we can do. Um, that is what every di district surrounding us is using 
in terms of um, how they can transport more students uh, to school. With lunch, lunch will be available at every elementary building. It might be a brown bag lunch, uh, but lunch will be available for students at the elementary buildings. We are not ready this week to say that lunch will be available um, for sit down lunch, even with brown bags at the middle school and high school. It may be that lunch is available to students. They pick up their brown bag and they leave. Uh, the schedule might be truncated and I use this for example purposes only. This is not what we are saying, but we may end up with some type of a schedule where students are dismissed at 1230, they take their lunch with them and, and they go. Um, it is the lunch piece that requires where six feet of social distancing is mandated. So that, that no one will uh, permit three, four or five feet of social distancing when children engage in their lunch activity. So, um, and we continue to say that the look and feel of school is go, you know, going to be different. And we'll talk a little bit about that this evening um, and also, also next week. So when we look at, um, this is what a lunch table is going to look like for a student at the elementary level. Um, so that is one of our eight foot tables. Um, there will be one student seated at one end, one student seated um, towards the side uh, of the other end. And that's it, how a cafeteria table is going to meet our social distancing re requirement. So if you take a look, the next um, picture that is here, that's actually Manoa Elementary's cafeteria. Um, those of you who have been in there are familiar with the size of that cafeteria. That is how it is set up um, with the tables and the chairs to be socially distanced appropriately. That cafeteria will now accommodate 46 students. Typically that a cafeteria could accommodate with the round tables and students sitting together. Uh, it has accommodated up to 130 students uh, at one point in time, one period of time. Uh, this will be 46 students. Uh, and then the gymnasium will be set up with a total of 40 tables that can accommodate um, 80 students. That is what we are looking at in each one of the elementary buildings. So the gymnasium will not be available for physical education. Uh, our physical education teachers will be encouraged to take students outside as much as possible um, or to go into students' classroom and deliver the health component uh, of what they're working on. Uh, our teachers will you know, have time to start to think about this and see what that could, what that could entail uh, as, you know, as we move forward. Moving on to the classroom level, uh, I had already indicated that we know we can look at um, distances of three feet and the angle, it's, it's actually hard sometimes to capture this in a picture so that you can see, see the distancing there, um, depending on the, the angle that it's there. That room is set up as if all students were attending. Again, this is in Manoa Elementary. That room is set up as if all students are attending. We know um, that there are a multitude of reasons for whom parents will opt to keep their children home you know, look for a 100% um, online opportunity for students, and that is going to be available to everyone. So as we get those numbers, what we will be doing is removing desks from, the, from those classrooms uh, and getting even, great, even greater so, social distancing. The next is a picture at, at our middle school. Uh, and again, it's set up accounting for all of the students uh, for their in-person instruction the angle isn't isn't really you know isn't really great, but I wanted you to see you know what it would what, you know what it could potentially look like. The next area that we talked about was screening, and there has been no change to this particular slide since our July second of uh, you know communication topics that we still continue to work on. Actually, um, one of our members asked tonight about you know um, is it a paper screening that's being used for uh, preseason in athletics one of the things that we're looking into is some kind of an app um, that we might be able to use uh, for you know, student screening, staff screening. Uh, so that work is still underway uh, for us to, to take a look at that. Uh, hygiene is the next area important that we've spoken about. And there's no change to this. This is the same exact screen that we were looking at uh, when we sent out the July 2nd communication. And where we have seen a change is on the next slide, which pertains to masking. All adults must wear face coverings, masks, or shields. Uh, we heard from, from Ms. Mathers this evening uh, that it would be advisable for our staff members to wear both. 
We have ordered both uh, because there, we recognize that there are staff members who may choose that. Uh, we'll now make it you know, part of a recommendation and that will be available uh, for staff members. All students must wear face coverings. We know that that is the governor's order that was effective July 3rd. Um, and that guidance will be on our website so that you know, people who may not have seen it yet uh, will be able to, to see that. The removal of the mask in order to eat lunch is what mandates the six feet of social distancing uh, for lunch. Uh, and that is why those, those areas looked, looked very different. So we could then get to, you know, these, if we take these plans and we looked at them by the phases, if we were going to say green, you know, yellow, red, uh, this is what we could do. Or, you know, we may end up saying, we're not going to worry about the phases right now. We want to start uh, with everyone in school, or we want to start uh, in, in some type of, of a hybrid. But for right now, we know that all students can attend five days a week. That's a little last Last week when I sent the communication out, we indicated to parents we knew that all students at the elementary level could attend five days a week. We were still looking into the secondary level. Or no, I had said mid elementary and middle, and we were still looking into the high school level. Uh, we now know that they can attend, uh, all could if we opt for that uh, five days a week. In order to do this though, time is going to be scheduled differently, different from what students, staff, and parents are accustomed to. So some examples, and again, this does not mean that these things are happening. This is an, to give someone an example. What would you mean that time, you know, would be scheduled? 8.30 may still be the time, you know, that, that children can arrive at the elementary buildings or 8.40, I don't have it committed, you know, committed to memory. Um, but instruction might not begin until 9.05 or 9.10. That's going to depend upon the, the arrival of buses. Even with two, two students to a seat, if every child were to attend Manoa Elementary and every child who has been transported there would still be transported, there would be 22 bus runs just to get the kids to school in the morning. So once we see, you know, how many students will be opting for Haverford, you know, Haverford online, uh, and then we'll look how many parents will be opting to transport their children. Uh, then we will look at two things then, what are the number of bus runs that will be bringing kids into, into the school? And then what does the car line become like in terms of dropping them off? So it, it just, I just give that share that with you tonight to provide an example of what we mean when we say that the schedule might be altered in, in some way. We know that time will be allocated for children to uh, san wash their hands, use the hand sanitizer before they eat lunch, after they eat lunch, after recess. If that's going to happen, we have to make it part of the day. It has to be part of the schedule. So the day is going to look, you know, look a little bit different. We know that the opening of school is going to look a little bit different. And the concrete example that I will, will give you there is another one at the elementary level. In some of our buildings, parents arrive and walk children to their classrooms the first day of school. That can't happen. We can't have that many adults coming in, into, into the buildings. What I will follow up with very quickly and say it remains our goal to make sure that we are nurturing, welcoming, and caring. And our, when our elementary principals get to working with some of the teachers and talking about, you know, what can we do? How can we restructure this? You know, we've been talking talking about reimagining school um, and what it can, you know, what it can look like. Uh, I am sure that they will come up with some very unique ways to ensure that the environment is nurturing that we are welcoming and, and the children feel, feel cared for. We're going to have to reduce the shared materials. So what do I mean by that? Usually parents would get a supply list, uh, you know, things might come in and they're put there in sort of a community place where, you know, where kid, everyone is kind of using them. Um, that may not, is not going to be the case. Um, and we also know that we will have parents who will send children with their own little bottles of hand sanitizer and, and such 
uh, and we'll make, make arrangements for them to have that available to them um, at all times. But we anticipate that those supply lists are going to look a little bit different. And this is not just for us, for, for us within the school district of, of Haverford Township. Springfield School District, Chichester, Rose Tree, Interborough, Westchester, Ridley, Garnet Valley, Marple, and Wallingford Swarthmore are all, we have all been working together looking at what, what it would look like because that they are looking at five days a week with everyone coming in. The only exception to that list is um, at Interborough, they still do not know that they can do that at their high school level. So it may be something a little bit different, but K to eight, um, they will all be in school, in school five days a week. Uh, so we've got, you know, great opportunities to pool together with those, surra those surrounding districts uh, and continue our discussions um, around planning. Uh, as we, if a change occurs and either the change occurs by more a restrictive direction, and if you can move over, a restrictive uh, direction to be more restrictive in any way, or we find out that in, in yellow, uh, we cannot offer instruction the way that it has been offered. Uh, we have been discussing what a hybrid model, you know, using some type of a, a flexible schedule. Um, you heard Ms. Mathers talk about, you know, children are in school for two days, there's a day of intense cleaning, and then another group um, would come for uh, the, uh, the other two days. There's also a model where you bring some students in every day um, and you teach some students remotely. Uh, and that's sort of what, um, the, what Interborough is looking at. You know, K to eight, they're coming in all day and they may be remote uh, at their secondary level. Uh, if we looked at something like that, I, I do think it's important to say, you know, that regardless of whether you're in every day or, you know, 100% remote, uh, students would still be able to participate in any kind of activity that we would be permitted to run. Uh, we would not say because you're participating in remote learning, you can't join whatever the club is uh, or, or activity. Um, and we'll talk more in detail uh, at the next meeting about what some of those models would look like and what the classrooms could potentially look like. Uh, we and we know that if we are back in red, that it is everybody um, virtual. virtual. Uh, and that is, again, I want to reiterate, that is not Haverford Online. Um, have the Haverford Online information um, will be, this is the same slide that was in the July 2nd communication, um, but we've got more information, as I said, at our next meeting. Uh, we will talk about uh, an opportunity to give people a little bit of insight into what Haverford Online will entail for children at the elementary level, at the middle school level, and at the high school level, because it would not be the same you know, for, for all of them. And then finally, we, you know, our next steps for parents and guardians, you know, view the meeting next week so that people can learn what Haverford Online is, what it has to offer. We are working on a survey. We thought we would send the survey out um, tomorrow, but we have decided there were probably a lot of people who would say, I want more information about Haverford Online before I respond to the survey. So we are going to have that survey and, and this is it. It will not be, as I mentioned before, it's not a long, long laundry list of questions. We're going to be asking about um, the intent for the children to attend um, in-person school, the intent for children to participate in Haverford Online, uh, the intent to use district transportation. Uh, and as I said, these are in very rough draft uh, form, but I wanted people to know it's not a long survey uh, that we would be sending out, um, out to them. So that gives you a little bit of update on the uh, decisions we've been able to make if we are five day in person um, in the schools. If there are any questions? Laura. Hi, thanks Dr. Rishi. Um, I did have a few questions. Um, for specifically the younger kids um, who are going to be sort of immobilized in their classrooms to minimize movement around the school, is there any thought about giving them additional PE time outdoors or additional recess time outdoors, especially where they could maybe take mask breaks um, and building that into the schedule? Is that something that's being considered? 
Yes, I was just, I just jumped into a meeting the elementary principals are having today. And, and when I came in, they were talking about mask breaks um, and, and how, and the importance of getting students outside more, you know, more often when they can. Okay, great. Um, and then um, Ms. Smathers mentioned that for, um, specifically for the, the schools that don't have air conditioning that we might wanna get, I think she said it was an environmental, an engineer, environmental consultant to come in um, is that something that we're thinking about doing? Because that, I mean, not having air conditioning plus wearing a mask plus, you know, minimal airflow through the space, that does seem like a health risk. Yes. Um, and we do already have, Dr. Crispin, um, Environmental Consultants Incorporated that already had an agreement with, um, with the district, uh, longstanding. Uh, they have been guiding us in some aspects of this plan. And I jotted that down when she mentioned that to follow great. up. Good, great. Um, and then um, something that I'm concerned about moving to the future, I think we all know that at some point we are probably going to be back in yellow um, or even red. I hope that we're not, but we probably will be. Um, and one main concern um, is if we have to move to some sort of a hybrid plan where um, especially the younger, the younger kids are only going to school maybe every other day or only two days a week or something like that. Um, that leaves parents who have to continue working in a, a pretty significant bind um, in terms of supervising their kids and trying to um, supervise their learning for the days that they're learning online. Um, have we considered talking with maybe the township and local childcare providers um, just to figure out maybe some, some kind of arrangement that parents, probably the, the school district wouldn't be responsible for it, but just some something that parents could have more information about so that parents could be proactive in lining something up should the need arise. We're meeting, well, um, Nicole Battistelli and I are gonna be meeting with the uh, child, local child care providers before the end of this month. I don't know that there's a date yet, but I will certainly let the board know when that is occurring. Our purpose for asking them to meet with us is so that we can make sure they are aware of, of our plans um, and what the plans would look like so that, that maybe they can make some modifications to, you know, to what they are offering. Okay, great. Um, and then my last question, um, for, for masking, um, for, for students, not for teachers and staff, but for students, um, I'm assuming that students are gonna need to wear probably a few different masks during the day. So they're gonna have to have a stash of masks with them because when they take it off for lunch, they would probably put a different one on. Um, or, you know, if they did PE, it would be sweaty and it wouldn't be as effective, that sort of thing. Um, so, so kids are going to need to have a lot of masks with them uh, in their classroom at any given time. Um, and I know right now a lot of parents are having a difficulty, like, getting enough masks for their kids just because locally there seem to be some mask shortages now that the, the universal masking requirements are in place. Um, is it possible that the school district could buy child size or um, like young adult size masks in bulk and then find a way to, you know, like like we do like a, a athletics fee or something like that um, to distribute those so that students could, or parents actually could have a much easier way to get masks. And then it would also be the kind of mask that we would want. Um, and it could actually be cheaper if we do that. If we do it in bulk, we could have some economies of scale so that we could help parents have the right thing, easier, less expensive. Is that a possibility? We can look, we can look into that. We have ordered, you know, so that we have mm -hmm. some. For, you right. Know, but yes, we can look into that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm done with questions. Bridget. I think you just gave all the PTOs some spirit wear ideas there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my question was, Dr. Rushi, uh, um, on your last slide in talking about a survey, and I just want to be clear on what that is. In other contexts, we have issued surveys, and it was kind of a general polling and a community barometer, um, but this sounded more like kind of a each family electing um, the choice for their family, and could you just speak to the distinction and kind of how binding the um, response to the survey in July might be? Um, this, I, I, it's not binding. Do you know, like if, if a parent came and, and said, 
you know, we, we answered this question, you know, for whatever reason, now we're not going to send our child to school where we want the Haverford online option. We would never say no. Uh, this is going to help us for our planning purposes uh, and where, you know, it becomes really critical for us is actually to get more of a sense of how many people are would want the Haverford online option, no matter what the district com comes up with, because that has staffing implications for us to, you know, to look at how many of those students and then do we, is it enough students that we can then look at the staff across the district and reassign some of the staff across the district to Haverford online? Or is it going to require that we, you know, hire ad additional staff? And that if we don't get enough people into Haverford Online, that will it will require hiring additional staff, um, and we want to make sure that we any hiring that we have to do that we have people on you know on time. Um, the other area that's really critical for us is the transportation piece because the difference between you know even ten bus runs to Manoa and twenty two bus runs to Manoa has a tremendous impact upon what the day will look like both in terms of arrival and dismissal. Okay. But it's um, not, I can't say it's, I can't say once you choose this, you can't go back. And so then it would be fair to say that participating in the survey isn't the final step in a process. If somebody then wanted to enroll in Haverford Online, it um, there would be paperwork and, and things like that beyond just clicking a response in the survey. Yes, what will happen, thank you for that question. What will happen is the people who indicate that they definitely want to participate in Haverford Online, they will be sent information to, to get that process moving so that their child can be you know, enrolled uh, in there. Ari? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rishi, those images that you shared with us from Manoa, lunchroom and classroom, were very helpful. Thank you. I didn't see any um, social or physical distancing X's or blue tape. A lot of us are probably pretty comfortable and familiar with those cues from going to the grocery store or um, just living life in a pandemic. Do you have plans to um, incorporate some signs or some blue tape or some ways to help like let's say a student doesn't come you obviously can't put a chair on that desk because it could block the view of another student so you would want to be able to help everyone know not to sit in that desk not use it not go anywhere near it and this way we can enforce physical distancing in our classrooms and lunchrooms yes that all that has been ordered it's actually we actually used our um cares act money for it to make those purchases. Tape, signage. Wonderful. Kristen? Yeah, um, so I'm just wondering about the survey that's gonna be going out. Will there also be a question about the hybrid model? Um, I see the two either in-person or online options, but nothing in between. Uh, if, as, long as, we can as much as we can describe it, sure. You know, I, I want to have more of a description. I don't want to frustrate people too much, you know, asking them to choose something that we've not thoroughly described. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to describe that and then put that on. Okay. And I apologize if I missed this. In this survey, will, will parents be indicating their names and addresses? I'm just wondering if this could be a good preliminary step, step to determine bus routes and who will be using which transportation services. Um, We'll it'll tie back, it ties back to an email address because okay. that's our primary method of, of communication. And they will be identifying like, you know, Haverford Middle School, seventh grade, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Manoa Elementary School, fourth grade, like they will be, will be asking them to complete that for each child. But we're okay. looking to see if we can do it a little bit differently this time and not have them do the whole thing all over. Like you log in once and you complete for each, for each child. Got it. Okay. So this won't be anonymous. It will be. No, we can actually get back to know to, and that's how we'll send them the information then for Haverford Online and start that process. Perfect. Thanks. Bridget, you have another question? Just to follow up, because I wasn't clear on your response to um, Ms. Larson. So in the survey, um, 
if the district's recommendation in the green phase is to go back um, and have kids be in school five days a week as much as possible, um, is there still a survey option for people to elect a hybrid or um, are the choices to go with the district plan or have referred online? It, it cannot be both. So if the question is, if we can get enough information and see how, the, how we can make it work, the question I imagine would read something to the extent of, I intend for my child or children to attend in-person school, and then maybe down next to that, only if it is a, you know, a hybrid option or you know, either something like some kind of wording there that it's it's a draft that we're still work, you know, working on um, or the other what you know intend for my children to participate and have referred online so it wouldn't be that we have some portion of the students who are attending full day some who are doing a hybrid and some who are on um on have referred online Is yeah, that we, can't, we can't staff that we can't staff it and we can't supervise or, mon or monitor uh, those three, you know, having those three options simultaneous. Right, I just, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Dr. Rushi. Our next agenda item is the Canvas overview and math audit update. Ms. Saxa, Dr. Nesbitt, and Dr. Tomaszewski. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg. Uh, good evening, members of the board, Dr. Rushi, administrators, and of course, members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity this evening to be uh, sharing with you some information regarding a Canvas overview, as well as our math audit update. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, but it looks like someone else is already sharing. So, ah, there we go. Now I should be able to do it. Uh, so, what we're going to talk about uh, this evening is uh, a little bit about the learning management system that has been mentioned at a prior meeting uh, as we're going to one to world for Haverford. Uh, we are going to be um, using what's called a learning management system. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me get everybody there. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. Uh, and great. Uh, so what we wanted to do was just uh, have a little live demonstration of what Canvas is. And to do that, we have uh, Dr. Jeremy Tomaszewski, who is serving as our district implementation mentor for instructional technology, as well as uh, serving has uh, as a long time serving uh, as our department chair for science at our high school. Uh, so after Dr. Tomaszewski shares a little bit of a demonstration in Canvas, then uh, Dr. Nesbitt, our STEM coordinator, will be providing a math audit update, particularly as it relates to Canvas, because we're going to be able to integrate some resources uh, into Canvas in a way that will be helpful for students. Uh, so before I turn it over to Dr. Tomaszewski, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we mentioned that all of this is in service of those strategic goals that we have talked about at prior meetings. Uh, we have three areas for those goals, social and emotional wellness, diversity and inclusion, and preparing contemporary citizens. And I think uh, we'll find that Canvas serves all of these purposes as it allows uh, a place for students to connect with each other as well as with their teachers. Um, our, our initiative to have all students have access to devices and to use such a learning system really um, supports uh, inclusivity and ensuring that there's equity and access to those resources. And certainly being able to use these kinds of um, tools to connect to the outer world uh, helps with our goal to prepare contemporary citizens. So at this time, I am going to stop sharing. So Dr. Tomaszewski, you could start sharing to, uh, to walk us through a live demo. Okay, um, let me find my screen that I need to share here. As Dr. Tomaszewski is doing that, I'll just describe okay. that uh, we have a series of uh, instructional technology mentors 
who are serving our colleagues as we get to know Canvas. They are at the elementary level. Each building has a mentor as well as one elementary level one. And our middle school and high schools have uh, uh, mentors in each of the areas of STEM, humanities, and unified arts, as well as building implementation mentors. And then Jeremy is uh, helping to coordinate all of those mentors. Uh, and he's the perfect candidate as he's been using Canvas and um, has even presented uh, for the uses of Canvas at conferences. And it's been uh, just an incredible resource for all of us. So thank you, Dr. Tom Tomaszewski, for presenting tonight. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Saxa, um, Dr. Rushi, and the board for, for having me here and letting me um, share some Canvas with you. Um, so to start things off, um, for those of you not familiar with a learning management system, um, it's more than just a place that assignments are stored or, or PowerPoints can be um, kind of housed for students to view later on. Um, it's also a, a place that students can interact with those assignments and those lessons. Um, they can watch videos, they can um, take a document and annotate that document individually or as a group and the teacher can, can monitor that, um, that interaction with the the curriculum. Um, there can be discussion boards and students can interact with those discussion boards via text and audio and even create little videos of themselves explaining their thinking. Um, they can submit videos for, for various assignments um, and one of my favorites is, is a peer review option that can be either anonymous or not um, where students can view each other's work and comment on it and be critical um, but thoughtful and, and provide that feedback. Um, and with that feedback, learning management systems like Canvas also allow the teacher to provide much more meaningful feedback, not just a grade um, or a few comments on a piece of paper, but I can also record my voice or send the student a video. Um, it was one of my favorite pieces of interaction with the students while we were away um, when the students shared their recordings and I can share my recordings back with them. Um, it kept that, that community and that connection going. Um, and one of the other great parts is it does integrate with so many of the different tools that we already use in our classrooms. Um, and like the, the name suggests, it is a system. Um, so as a student, all of the courses are gonna be here. Um, I even have my clubs in Canvas. Um, I can interact with my, my students who are part of the various clubs. Um, they can sign up for things like Discover Day um, and join different groups and, and do things that way right through Canvas. Um, and it's a great organizational tool for that as well. Um, so what I've done is just created a, uh, a fake schedule for an imaginary elementary student. Um, and I, my day job is teaching calculus-based AP physics. I'm about as far as a, from an elementary teacher as one could get. Um, I do have a, however, have a, a seven-year-old who's gonna be starting second grade next year um, in another district. So I have seen the parent end of the learning management systems and, and how it can also be very frustrating if it's not done well. Um, and I think we have a, a process in place to do it well. Um, so this, um, when a student first logs into Canvas, they'll arrive at their dashboard. And you can see that there are a couple panels here. Um, I've created a couple of classes for this student. So there are four panels on the dashboard. Um, some of our elementary students will um, pull out for, for various specials or um, help in math or reading or something like that. So all of their courses would show up here. Um, while we're on the dashboard, this is kind of the global navigation part of things. Um, you can see over on the right-hand side, there's a to-do list. So anything that the teachers in any of the classes assign will show up in chronological order of the date that they're due. Um, and if I scroll down a little bit here, you can see that there's a feedback section as well, where any, um, anything that's been graded or given feedback by the instructor will also show up here. Um, and then over on the left-hand side, I'll, I'll point to this calendar feature as well. Um, and this is another really nice thing, um, perhaps more so at the secondary level where you have multiple teachers assigning multiple um, assignments. Um, but at the calendar level, um, once this populates, you'll see all of the assignments for all of your classes show up. Um, and obviously there's not a whole lot here right now, um, but as the school year goes on, they'll be able to view when they have tests, when they have homework that's due, um, and anything that the teacher puts into the calendar will show up here. I'm gonna go back, back to the dashboard for a minute and dive into one of these courses. I'll open up this one um, and it just takes a click. Students can rearrange those tiles any way they want. They can put color codes on them. Um, 
And again, I am logged in as a student right now. Um, so this is just a imaginary science course that I put together. And now there's a to-do list over on the right-hand side for that course specific assignments. Um, so the teacher can set up their front page where the student um, arrives when they click on that tile. When I scroll down here, this is again, just one example of a way that things can be set up. We can put buttons in here. Um, here I've just got tiles for each day of the week um, and the assignments for that specific day. And I'm gonna just click to start learning today. Um, I tried to put little icons in here to differentiate when the student needs to just view an item, when they need to contribute something, or a little rocket ship for when they need to submit something back. Um, and the student knows that it's complete if they look on the right-hand side. I've already viewed today's morning message, message or Monday's morning message. Um, and that little green check shows up. So I'm gonna start with the very first assignment um, because um, all students love to start, second graders love to start with um, some back of statics in the morning. Um, but down in the bottom right corner here, there's a next button. So as soon as they finish and they view that, that video, they can hit next and they know that that's completed. And that's gonna bring me right to the, to the very next assignment for that day. It happens to be a discussion about sharks. Um, so the instructor asked us to tell us about your favorite shark. Um, so I'm gonna open up the reply. And I have lots of different ways that I can respond to this prompt. I can simply type something in the text box. Um, I can also click the little play button here and record media. Um, if I have something saved, I can upload it. Um, this is trying to start my webcam, which is already going. So there I am again. Um, and I can record and submit that recording right through the discussion board. Um, my peers can then comment on it. Um, and there are various settings in there where um, the student has to uh, submit something first prior to uh, being able to, to view their classmates' responses. So you get some unique responses that way. Um, and then again, once I'm done with that assignment, I'm going to click the next button. And here I've embedded a brain pop assignment. Um, so I think brain pop is something that we use um, at the elementary levels. This happens to be on sharks. Um, and if it loads properly, they don't have to leave Canvas to do their brain pop assignment. It loads right within Canvas. Um, here's our, our assignment on sharks. They can watch the video and then take the quiz and the teacher can put the directions right up top here. Um, and the kids, kids submit everything right through Canvas. Um, and again, I'm just gonna continue moving along and hit my next button. Um, here I have another just video um, and I put the little eyeballs there so the student needs, knows that they need to just view that item. There's nothing to submit. Um, here I have a report on sharks. Um, this is uh, a PDF of some shark report that they're gonna um, write on and, and turn in. Um, so if it, my screen share followed the tab that opened, it opened in a new tab, um, Cami is loading now. Um, which is one of the tools that the district has purchased for the students. I think Dr. Nesbitt is gonna show some examples of that in the, um, the, the next presentation as well. When he uh, speaks about summer school, he's got some actual student work. Um, but students can take this PDF um, and use all of the tools on the left-hand side here. They can do um, their drawing and actually write on the document. They can insert the, some text box. Um, all sorts of different things. And again, that is submitted right in, um, in Canvas. I'll have the next box again. Here we, we get to a quiz. Um, and there are, again, lots of different variations that teachers can use um, for the quizzes. You can um, allow a certain number of attempts. So here I've allowed five attempts. Um, and then the way that this is set up is it requires the students to get two out of three questions correct before um, this is marked complete in their little table um, that I showed you earlier. Um, and the quizzes can be anything from multiple choice to free response. They can be matching. Um, here is a little math quiz with um, a multiple choice followed by a free response. 
Um, I think this is actually a formula question. So Canvas actually generates these numbers and each student can get different numbers um, and Canvas will automatically grade that um, based on some formula that's been entered into that. Um, and then this would be a matching one as well. So choose the number of sides, you have the drop down menu and students can do that. Um, and that's just a very small sample of the number of quizzes um, that are available. And I'm gonna submit this quiz, I'll say okay. Tells me my quiz is saved. I didn't answer any questions, but that's okay. Um, I can take the quiz again. My current score is a zero out of three. It took me less than a minute to do it. Um, and it gives me that feedback of things that are unanswered. Um, built into the, the multiple choice questions as well, you can actually put feedback um, that the students would receive if you give them multiple chances to take the quiz. So if they select a wrong answer, you can give them that hint that might direct them to that correct answer. Um, if they select the right answer, you can say, hey, great job remembering to do that task that you just did. Um, you remembered the negative sign. You remembered um, this other piece of information that was really critical in solving that. Um, and you can put all of those at the question level. Uh, I think I have just one more page here. So I hit next one more time. Um, and I see that my work for the day is done. Um, great work today. I click that and it brings me back to um, my homepage. Um, what's seen on the left here is um, able to be changed depending on the course. I left a few of these open just so that I can kind of navigate now without logging out and logging back in. Um, I'll, I'll show a quick example of what I would do at the secondary level and how that might be slightly different. Um, but none of these things, none of these tools are level specific. Um, so here's something that I would do in an AP physics class, let's say. Um, so I have a, a tile for just about the course. My course outline breaks down the percentage of each um, content. Some common course documents that they're gonna find um, easy access to throughout the, um, the semester. And then I might have a tab for the weekly schedule. And I can link to the assignments right within that schedule. And I might have some in-class assignments and some at-home assignments. Um, and in designing these two pages, um, I was thinking about doing something like this uh, if we're in person and I'm in front of the students and I can direct them a little bit more. And if we do end up going virtual, I can just do what I just did in front of you and publish that other page. It's as simple as um, marking the page as the front page. So I can change which front page I'm using based on whether we're in class or, or virtual. Um, and all the, the courses, the, the links to the different modules are all there um, and those are held. So it's a very easy transition back and forth. It's, it's really versatile. Um, the number of tools that we can embed and use across the district are um, too many to name uh, in, in time that we have today. Um, but there are tools that obviously I would use in my um, high school classrooms um, that would be different than in the elementary classrooms. Great, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, speaking of using them at the various levels, uh, we're going to ask Jeremy to stop sharing now and Dr. Nesbitt will begin sharing. And he's gonna talk a little bit about um, our math audit. And then he's gonna conclude that with how we can use Canvas in addition to some math resources. So thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, done a lot of board presentations over the years. I don't think I've ever started one this late. I think I normally ended this late. So i um, really excited to show uh, what Canvas is and how Canvas can integrate with some new free resources that we're looking at. Uh, we've used Canvas at the high school for over 10, 11 years and the science department really pioneered it and was using it for lots of things. Just again, as a reminder of where we were in the curriculum audit cycle, um, we were at the point where we were auditing the math, uh, math curriculum. Uh, we had looked at the math standards, the math standards for mathematical practices. Uh, we were talking about how important these math practices are, um, that it's beyond just the standards. We had a very large committee that was looking at all sorts of materials. Um, throughout the year, we had visited several schools uh, we had designed an instrument to evaluate curriculum. We'd read many different articles about the math practices. We had presentations by uh, several different companies, Envision Math, Math in Focus, College Prep Math, 
illustrative math at the middle school. Uh, and we had reviewed the math vision project in Eureka math all um, up until March of this school year. Um, in March of this school year, the one thing that we decided was we wanted more electronic resources. There were a lot of good programs out there. There were some really good free programs out there, but they needed more technology to support them. Uh, and we at the early March had decided we were going to take uh, next the summer and fall to make a final decision on some things. Um, but then in late March, um, we, after experiencing being out of school and now being in pandemic teaching, uh, we realized that the electronic resources for both our elementary program and our high school program would not be available for the entire school year next year. Um, our, our online access to our electronic, uh, electronic school book for the elementary level is based upon a technology called Flash, and that will not be able to be visible on any browser on January 1st, 2021. Um, so in other words, if we need access to electronic resources uh, in January of 2021, our present 2013 um, math book would not work. Um, and our high school did not purchase electronic access to books, so they also did not have access to electronic books. The company was nice and gave them to us for free this year, but would not be providing them to us for free for next year. So we began to look at these free products and a combination of reviewing all of these free products and the reality that between March and uh, between March and June, the school district moved towards a one-to-one -one, uh, one world um, effort and also adopted Canvas. Uh, it makes adopting some of these free resources or using some of these free resources uh, much easier. So. Uh, we had presentations and reviewed uh, Eureka Math for K to five and Illustrative Math for six through Algebra two, um, with the, the entire math group uh, throughout the end of May and early June. Um, and what we found was that these free products are they're essentially PDFs of textbooks. So in a way, it makes um, the book. You can purchase a book, you can photocopy and produce your own book, or you can put the PDFs into uh, a learning management like Canvas and may not necessarily need to use the book. Um, Susan, you always like me to tell stories. One of the things that as we were going through this, my own students, uh, they use Canvas at Ridley and have been using Canvas. My son is entering ninth grade and started using Canvas in first grade. Um, he, I don't believe, has ever brought home a math book. Everything he has done has been on his iPad and in solving things. And as we transitioned to this um, world where we were doing online learning, and my kids were working in their rooms, I would go into the rooms and say, what are you doing? And they just pull up Canvas and all of their assignments were on it. And they easily navigated. My daughter's in fifth grade. My son was in eighth grade. And they just showed me all the various things that they were doing. And it was exactly the same thing that they had been doing in school up until the, the March date when we were out of school. So I didn't have to train them on how to log in because when they're in school, they use Canvas to do their work. And when they moved out of school, they knew how to log in to Canvas to do their work. And when Jen started asking me questions, well, what do you do for an announcement? What do you do for a discussion? I went to my kids and I'm like, so what's an announcement? And they're like, dad, it's an announcement. Well, what do you use a discussion board? Well, we use a discussion, have a discussion with kids for. So they did not find any of the nuances of Canvas to be different. So we uh, moved many of these free resources into uh, a Canvas program right away in order to um, do it for summer school uh, because we knew summer school was going to be remote. Um, and so we have, uh, we literally, started summer school, I guess it was June 29th. And so we put free resources into these courses, um, made a couple videos for kids who had never been in Canvas before and not had not used uh, some of these Eureka math programs. And uh, the reviews have been really, really positive. So uh, this is what the third grade math Canvas looks like. Um, we built classes for first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Essentially there's a lesson plan and in a video for the kids to watch, there's a problem set and an exit slip for them to complete. Um, and this 
again, I, I think I'm logged in here as, a, as an instructor. So the way that you log into it, you see it one way if you're an instructor and you see it a different way if you're the student, but essentially the students see uh, a piece of paper, but it's a digital piece of paper. And then they can, as Dr. Tomaszewski was showing, use all sorts of tools to write on this paper. Um, and so in the very first day of summer school, um, one of the students got one of the assignments and uh, I removed that student's name from the assignment, but um, was able to submit their work. Uh, and you can see all of the work that the student submitted right on this document. It went electronically uh, right to the teacher and the teacher was able to provide feedback to it. And this is how all of our summer school students work has been done. Um, and they've, you know, they've actually spoken highly of the experience. They've spoken positively of it and they've been able to submit their work and get their work graded. And it's all been through the virtual interaction. But if you're in class, you can also still do all of it this way um, through the learning management system. So after showing the, the free resources to the teachers and talking about the complexities of uh, trying to continue with some of our, our present products, we asked if we should use uh, the free products for the school year of next year. Um, and when we started the math audit process, I was kind of pulling my hair out, hoping that one day I could get them to agree to some extent on something because there's just so many good math products out there. And, and really there are different goods and bads about every program. Um, but when we ended up in May and June and we have you know, a Wonder World initiative and we've got Canvas and we look at these free math programs and what they offer, um, an overwhelming majority said, yes, we should utilize these free resources for the following school year. So at the elementary level to get 90% of 100 teachers agree to anything is pretty amazing. At the middle school, 100% of the teachers agreed. And at the uh, high school, one of the 17 teachers, I think said it's too much, but all of the other teachers said, let's move forward and adopt the free resources. So that is our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. We're um, just constantly mindful that we are moving stu uh, students forward, um, but at the same time, we want to meet them where they are, and, and we believe that we will be able to um, try out these resources that Dr. Nesbitt is talking about for a year and learn about how they work, how they integrate. We can do so without having to take on the extra expense that it would take to um, actually get access to our current materials electronically, which as Dr. Nesbitt said, we will not have uh, as the school year progresses. Um, and it really goes along with where we started this presentation, which was with connecting uh, and, and preparing contemporary citizens. Uh, that being said, this does not, uh, using a learning management system, using you know these resources and trying them out for the year, does not mean that students will never have a book in front of them, does not mean they will always have the laptop or the, the Chrome tablet in front of them. We will still have teachers talking to children, you know, there will still be live interactions. Um, of course, there will still be paper and pencil work. There will still be go outside and try this kind of work. It's just that now it's possible to also do this work, which will actually be more efficient for our teachers in many ways, um, which will allow us to differentiate for students. Uh, which will allow us to have uh, offer programs to students that can personalize according to how they answer this, then they get that problem. Um, so it can really help to uh, augment as well as modify what we're able to do while still keeping all the really great things about school and the personal interactions and the pieces where we, you know, the teachers do the teaching and the children do the, the work and the interacting. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you uh, to Dr. Tomaszewski and Dr. Nesbitt for sharing uh, how this could look and, and a little bit more about the systems themselves. Thanks, Jen. Any questions or comments from the board? All right. Looks like that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Very nice job. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that work and for the work that you've been doing with the, with the teachers. Uh, Jeremy, we are so optimistic that you're going to be bringing some leadership 
uh, to, to this work in terms of you know looking at Canvas and all it can provide for you know for us. Uh, and Jeff, you're you've done great work with the teachers with the math curriculum. Uh, thank you both for your hard work. Thank you. Thanks. No it's pressure nice. though, right, Dr. Rushi? No questions, <laughs> but I want to compliment you on a job well done. Uh, you know, as I I always say stories and you laugh at me, but Dr. Tomaszewski, you gave us a beautiful report. When Jeffrey went in the bedroom with his son and said, what are you doing? And we knew exactly what he was doing. That kind of makes it clear for all of us. So thank you, gentlemen. You did a great job. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And it's nice to focus on curriculum and learning in the midst of all these discussions about more, um, more challenging and unusual circumstances. So it, it's nice to get grounded in, in the core work that we're doing. Okay, next item on the agenda uh, is introduction of a draft resolution supporting the development of an anti-racist school climate by the Board of Directors. And just by way of a little bit of context, um, as you know, uh, I guess for about the last 18 months, uh, the district has been involved with their basis program uh, that uh, addresses a lot of, a lot of these issues. Uh, the work of the, the, the working group there, it's been a little bit interrupted uh, for the last few months by uh, the COVID epidemic. Um, but um, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association, especially uh, with the events of the last couple months, uh, has uh, begun to provide uh, a number of resources to help uh, school boards in this regard. Uh, one is uh, this anti-racist uh, resolution. Uh, another is a uh, board policy on equity. Uh, and so we're introducing this resolution tonight as a vehicle for board discussion. Um, it has some a significant fill in the blanks at the end in terms of uh, what actual work the board might uh, want, want done in this regard. And I believe that uh, with input from the board, we would most likely move this into the uh, chart of work for the for the basis program. It seems like that would be a, uh, a good fit. Um, and they could uh, perhaps coordinate getting input from stakeholders. So uh, with that, I'll open it up to the board. Questions or comments from the board? Kristen. Thanks. Um, I just want to be sure that any work we're doing with this resolution actually um, results in action and that this does not get put in a book of resolutions where it, it goes to die, um, that we just sign so we can feel good about having done something that said, had the words anti-racist in it. Um, so I'm looking forward to developing some of the action items further um, and making this something that the community can have input in um, as we work to actually operationalize anti-racist, um, an anti-racist school climate here in Haverford. That's the purpose of the resolution. If you look at the, the, uh, the last paragraph, um, it calls for uh, listing action steps that the district has taken or will take, uh, such as adoption of an equity policy, conducting professional development, or an equity audit or other steps. So that's what the, the board's work will be. And that's hopefully will be what we'll pass along to the basis group uh, for them to, to work on. Great, and as we're doing that, I just want us to keep in mind, we are an overwhelmingly white group of um, board members and staff here. So I just wanna make sure that we ensure we're getting the input of people of color in this document. We certainly will. Other questions or comments from the board? All right, so um, I would say if the board wants to chew on this for a week or so and perhaps get back to me with uh, any suggestions or comments and then uh, we can bring it back up at the next board meeting and perhaps uh, dispatch it to, to the basis folks with some specific goals and tasks in mind. Does that sound like a plan? 
Um, Mr. Feinberg, if just if I could remind our other, you know, our board members that next week's board meeting does include a presentation from some of the folks who have been engaged in the basis basis work. I know Sarah is looking to have others with her as part of the presentation. Um, so not to prolong, I don't intend to prolong passing of the resolution, but people might want to wait and hear that and then, you know, put that together with their thoughts and and give some feedback sounds like a plan uh, next item on the agenda uh, and this is a, a something relatively new for us the board uh, occasionally has uh, subsets of the board meet on particular uh, policy areas like uh, finance curriculum uh, and board policies and uh, the finance committee, the finance group met last week, uh, and Vice President Wiedemann has an update for us from that meeting. Thank you. Yes, yeah, we actually met on, it was just Tuesday, <laughs> so it's weeks, Seems like a, week. a lot going on this week, um, but we met on Tuesday um, with Dr. Rushi, Mr. Regal, Mr. Kaiser, and um, some consultants from public financial management who has who have guided um, uh, the board and the district on financial matters and, and our bond issuances and things. Um, there were three topics of uh, discussion. One is a refinance opportunity that's on the agenda for tonight. Um, we had asked uh, public financial management to seek proposals to refinance about $15 million of our debt, and they succeeded in getting proposals from five banks um, that came in at a lower rate than what we've got now. Uh, TD Bank issued a very aggressive rate of 1.39% um, taxable, prepayable, and fixed over nine years. That will save us a total of approximately a million dollars with 529,000 recognized in this coming school year, 223,000 um, in the following year and small, smaller amounts thereafter. Uh, and it's noted that the advantageous rate that we were able to um, be offered reflects uh, current market conditions as well as the district's creditworthiness, um, our long-term banking relationship with TD, and just the term and structure of the debt itself. Um, so this was an opportunity the uh, finance liaisons um, agreed should be presented for uh, discussion and decision tonight. Um, the liaisons also had an opportunity to look at um, a budget modeling tool, uh, again, presented by PFM. Um, they've got, they did a demo of their Synopsys software. That's a long range budgeting planning system that was developed specifically for school districts. The uh, platform would be based on um, school district have for townships historical financials and our ledger of accounts. Um, and then the software would uh, be able to develop future budgets based on a variety of assumptions that um, our business department could put in and then um, different scenarios could be managed and the results can be depicted in charts and graphs and tables um, for analysis and communication with the with the board and public. Um, there is a cost with a one-time setup fee of $5,000 and then a subscription of $7,500 for a year. And um, that's something that we're interested in getting more information on um, how the software could be used and the cost savings that it could generate and efficiencies in um, the development of uh, the budgeting for our school district, which has a annual operating budget of over $125 million now. Um, and then finally, the third uh, discussion was um, around the COVID health and safety grant. Um, our budget is going to be is going to need to be adjusted to reflect our receipt of three hundred and forty two thousand dollars of grant funds via the CARES Act, um, and there will be an equal amount of COVID related expenditures. And we heard about some of them tonight um, for hand sanitizer, face shields, masks tape um, and like Zoom subscriptions and other things that would uh, allow the school to operate safely during the pandemic. That's my finance report. Questions or comments from the board? 
Thank Bridget. you, Bridget. Anytime, Second. anytime you want to bring us a million dollars, please feel free. That's uh, that's good news. Next item on the agenda is for information purposes only. Secretary to submit for insertion into the minutes proof of publication as it relates to the schedule of regular public meetings for the 2020-2021 school year. Next item is uh, budget transfers. I'll accept a motion to approve all transfers and adjustments necessary to close the financials for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Larson moved. Fleischer second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Could someone just speak to why they, those adjustments and transfers aren't specified here? Usually we get some pretty specific account transfer information. Uh, okay. That's because most of them haven't been made yet. And uh, we're, we're, you're giving us authority to do the transfers and adjustments necessary to close out the books. They involve accounts payable and accrual uh, adjustments that we make in the next 60 days. And then also transfers to cover any small areas where uh, the we've overspent that part of the budget for some reason or another. And uh, what it does is when we have to do our annual financial report for the state, we can't give them a report that shows a negative balance in any one particular function area. So we do some transfers just if there's a small area where there's a negative and uh, it just balances things out. So it's, a, it's part of the finishing product that we end up providing the independent auditors of our financial statements. Bob, those transfers would then come back to us for, for board approval? No, what we do is uh, normally we would accumulate the transfers and then put in a report just like your budget transfers that you approve. And then retroactively, you're supposed to put it back into you know, the, the minutes of this meeting. Okay. Now we can do it the other way too. We can just give it to you, uh, at, you know, for informational purposes, but that's the, what, normally what you would do. We'd retroactively put those in the minutes uh, Probably in, in uh, August when you approve the minutes, that they'll be in there. So, okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Next item, I'll accept a motion to approve disbursements from the general fund, totaling three million six hundred seventeen thousand three hundred five dollars and fifty eight cents. Did we have to vote on the prior matter? You mean like a roll call? It, it's not a roll call. No, but there was no vote. Yeah, but there it doesn't need to be a roll call. So I'll just accept a motion. We had the motion and the second in the discussion, but not a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bridget. Okay, now I'll accept a motion to approve disbursements from the general fund totaling $3,617,305.58. Crispin moved. John Grass second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the incurrence of non-electoral debt. Uh, <sighs> Board's move. We. Crispin second. Moved and second. Uh, do we want to uh, one of the folks to give us a very brief. I'll jump in. I, I, Amy's here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here and, and George is here. I can't really add much more than what Bridget said. Uh, the only thing I'll mention is, uh, should you approve this tonight, 
we would look to settle on August 20th. And secondarily, the years one additional potential upside to the district, uh, TD Bank will include potentially in the note, the ability to turn this rate from a taxable rate to a tax-free rate if there's a change in tax code. So that, there could be an upset of an, an additional $200,000 if that were to happen in, in, in the future. So for now, we know we're gonna save a little over a million dollars and there could be some upside if there's a change in tax code. Any other questions or comments from the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. Roll call vote, please. Okay, roll call. Bob? Okay, uh, Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Lars Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Nine voting yes. Thank you and thank, thank you. you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie, George. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Have a good one. Okay. Next item on our agenda, I'll accept a motion to accept the retirements resignations as listed. Crispin moved. Fleischer second. Second, Minji. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept a motion to approve the, the appointments as listed. Crispin moved. Snodgrass second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept a motion to approve the leave requests as listed. Until moved. Crispin second. second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve an educational service contract with the Devereaux Foundation for two students attending for the 2020 extended school year at a cost not to exceed $26,406. Moved. Second. Moved and Pleasure. second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Just a reminder, item 6B, we had uh, removed from the agenda for future consideration. Next item, I'll accept a motion to approve the health and safety plan for the return to athletics. Wiedemann moved. Second, Minji. Moved and second. Any discussion? I would yeah, um, Larry, I, I, I would like to say, just to bring up one of my concerns here, I guess. Um, we, we as board members re received this plan earlier this week, but you know, it seems that, oh, it, 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 it seems that no parents yet, nor the public has had a chance to, to review this. Now, I mean, I don't have kids in athletics in school. I've, I, I have one child in district. You're not in the athletic program. You know, I asked some questions this evening, but I don't even know what questions really need to be asked. And I have a little bit of concern with proving something prior to being seen by the public. I mean, is, is, is there an opportunity to give them at least a weekend? I, I mean, I, I, we're supposed to start, I, I guess preseason on 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 the thirteenth, which is which which next Monday, but if nobody's had a chance to look at this yet and provide their comments. Plus, if the comments that many of us made this evening could be incorporated prior to approving this thing, prior to approving this plan, um, it would be possible to at least give a couple of days and then call a special meeting on mo next Monday or Tuesday to have a vote and an approval for this. I I really have a hard time voting in favor of this if it hasn't had a chance to be vetted through, through the process. 
I'm going to agree with Dave on that as well. Um, I also just learned from a member of our community that one of our sports teams has multiple athletes in quarantine currently um, because they were exposed to a known COVID case. So we could be running up against an issue where these students report to practice because they need to be present in order to get playing time. Um, I understand preseason is voluntary, but if a coach doesn't see certain players show up, they may not play those um, those athletes when it comes time to actually be playing. Um, so, I mean, that could definitely put our students at risk and shut this down pretty quickly. I agree with Dave, there should be a public comment period. Um, we also gave volumes of feedback tonight, um, a lot of which I think is critical and necessary to clarify this plan. So I would like to see um, these revisions incorporated, um, also for there to be a public comment period. Um, so we can really ensure our coaches and our student athletes safety. Um, also, it sounds like some of this information was possibly um, distributed to families ahead of time prior to it being approved by the board, um, which I can't fully understand. That assumes that we all just would have said yes. Um, so I'm, I'm not really thrilled how that went down. Um, but again, there are some changes that need to be incorporated. So if we vote yes tonight, we're voting on a draft. So if we could see those changes incorporated, get some public comment and then bring it back for the board, um, I'd be happy to vote yes next week, but I'm definitely a no tonight. And I have to agree with you. I disagree with you a little bit, Kristen. The way it goes in, in high school sports is kids have already started, whether their coaches called them or not called them. As Bridget said, whether it's captain's practice or it isn't, the word gets out. Just as someone repeated to you that they heard 10 kids are in quarantine for COVID. Do we have those names? Do we have those numbers? We're hearing. We hear all this stuff. I was more than impressed with Joanne Patterson and Pete when they said they didn't do what the other districts in the Central League have done. We didn't tell them good job on that. They didn't do that. They waited. They waited. They wrote this report. They took their time. We got it to, We got it in the beginning of the week. I was always under the impression with Dr. Rushi that if we had questions, we would send them to her on any report that we got and she would answer them. I never saw any questions. If I had any questions, I did send them and I got answers to them. So, so Susan, I, I did, I submitted my questions and you know that we're not allowed to submit all of our questions to the entire board because of sunshine laws. Right. Um, I'm also talking about, this is a couple days. Let's hold off a couple days just to ensure safety and make sure that we have a plan that the board can truly stand behind. Our names are, we're signing this. We are the ones who are approving this and potentially opening our students and our coaches up to harm. It's just a couple days. Let's take the precaution. I thought that they're going to miss out a whole lot of practice. I mean, if we if we could hold a special meeting on Monday, they will miss literally one day of practice. That's not going to make or break anybody's season. It would it it, it is simply to give the parent. I mean, especially the parents. Parents have to sign. You know, we're signing this res this resolution. Parents are also going to be signing a resolution. This 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 signing on to this plan. The parents also have to sign a waiver. If 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 some of those parents have a problem with the plan don't want to sign that waiver, we can, have to, we can end up with a whole new problem when this happens next week. We have half the kids who have signed, half the kids who haven't. It may turn out that everybody says, great, love the plan, we are going with it. That's I great, to, but I want to know that we have that first. Otherwise, I mean, then we can say, if somebody has a problem later on, we can say, well, you had a chance to review this, you signed on to this thing. Right now we're saying, sign it and we'll figure out what we do later on. I, this is this is about this is a health issue. It is, I think, is way too important to. Just uh, now, cross I would like to say, I would just suggest that we separate um, the feedback from the board and the, uh, you know, information that the board would like to see in, included in there. Rightfully so, those changes need to need to be made. Um, and if you want to see those changes before you before you approve it, that that's certainly fine. I am going to say, I caution you to say that this plan should be put out there for input on a voluntary preseason three week, what like part of what you do as an elected board uh, is to read this, ask the questions, look for, you know, look for your questions to be addressed and then to vote, you know, to vote on, to vote on it. Um, so I just ask you to separate the, those two requests there and think a little bit about that. I mean, and, and, and that's fine, Dr. Rushina, and, and, and I appreciate that. I guess my, my point is that I don't necessarily want to 
wait until everybody in, you know, had the chance to come in. I just want to know if there's any concerns out there that one of us hasn't seen that we could then bring up for, you know, for inclusion or, 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 or for, all, for, or for alteration. I know nothing is ever going to get done. Free. Nothing is ever going to get done. If you do, if you, to have that viewpoint, like you're never going to do anything. There's students and parents that are waiting to participate in the preseason and voting no or postponing it. Like nothing's ever going to get done. Like done it's in four not days. Sal, I thought that the presentation. Sal, are you on district great. payroll? <laughs> no, but no, no, that's but not fair. You, you know, you, by why. by appeasing a certain by appeasing a group of a certain group of people by saying no, you're also turning around and telling another group of people that you don't respect their wishes to get back to uh, training and athletics. I mean, th again, I'm. I'm I feel like it's deja vu. I'm in a situation where I'm saying the, the presentation was made really well. And there, there were questions that were being made and we, we made the questions and they were answered. I, I mean, I, I'm, I don't understand what else needs to happen to say, go forward with this and make adjustments as necessary. I'm sorry, I, I just don't. So if well, someone handed you a contract that was a draft, would you sign off on it? And they said, oh, we're gonna integrate your feedback. Don't you worry about that. I, I don't you see sign off on that in this that would preclude me from voting yes. Not just someone handing it to you, professionals who have done this yeah. for years, who are saying this is our best idea. This is what we are offering for this district. Talk to us about it. We gave it to you Monday. And we said, okay, we've got it. We all read it. Now all of a sudden nobody read it or, or no one really knows what's on there. There were great questions asked tonight. And I completely agree, Kristen, that we should wait the four days and get in there, the, some of the responses that were in there. But I also completely agree that we have to trust our people. We had an hour presentation tonight from a math man, a math genius and, and a science genius on something nobody even asked a question. We had the presentation because last week nobody liked it. Now all of a sudden we didn't even have a question for them. What was different? I don't understand that we're not, I don't understand why we're not taking professionals advice. We hired these people, we put them in this place. Do we wanna change the athletic plan? Okay, we ask great questions. But the idea that that's just, I'm just gonna wait and see what the public thinks is, is not trusting our professionals. That's my opinion. Yeah, that's not what I said. I'm not saying this is going out to the public and let them comment and they can develop the whole plan themselves. I trust what our professionals have put in place, but you know, as well as I do, there are so many unknowns right now. And this is actually a life and death matter in a way that our decisions have not been life and death matters in the first place. So if, you know, if we want to use our kids and our staff as guinea pigs, then I don't like that. That's on the board. Never say, that's please don't ever say that again. That's not fair. Not to, me and not to anyone. How dare you? I don't that's like that. But well, you're going to give me an excuse to use the gavel for the first yeah. time. In my How life. dare you, Kristen? Do it, Larry. <laughs> Let's settle I would, down. I would like to, first of all, no, no one's going to accuse me of not being pro-athletics. Uh, I'm a very staunch supporter of athletics. I, I do um, not love the idea of getting the plan and voting on it the same night. Just for a little context. It wasn't the same night. The community is getting it and we're voting on it the same night that we're getting it in the, in the community forum. Just for a little context, I looked around the Central League and Delco. Lower Marion's plan, eight pages approved on June 22nd. Radner's plan, nine pages approved on June 23rd. Rose Tree Media Plan approved on um, June 25th and TE Plan, longer than ours actually, 31 pages approved on 629. Um, I would really like to see our plan condensed um, for parents and student athletes and coaches and sort of a one page hard card uh, so that everyone is able to more easily follow. And if, if Dr. Rushi, you can take and um, Mr. Donaghy and Ms. Patterson can take take the um, the questions and the feedback we've given you tonight and and uh, implement them before Monday. That would be great as well. 
I have a procedural question, which is how many days notice do we, would we need to give for a special meeting? Greg, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Greg? I believe that you could schedule a meeting with 24 hours notice. I was just gonna add, since I think I'm the only person on the board who has high school athletes active at this time, that I was um, comfortable with the plan. I appreciate these are crazy circumstances. I think the, the plan contains um, the majority of parameters that parents and athletes and coaches will be looking for for guidance. I understand that um, there will be adjustments and learnings and things that are made. Um, and some of those might be challenging, but um, I know our students are, and coaches are eager to get started. Um, I also know that as a parent of high school <laughs> students and activities, um, the parents are not the go-to for a lot of this information. The kids get it directly and, and are involved and engaged and, and kind of manage their activities. So um, that I think I'm assuming parents would know to expect some forms and we'll be able to turn those around and, and submit them if, you know, if they have questions, that's the coaches and administration can, can handle that. Um, this to me feels like um, uh, something that's been thoughtfully crafted, has a couple of comments to be adjusted, but don't really change the, um, the underlying guidance that this document provides. Um, and I think it's in a workable form so that um, our student athletes and coaches can get started um, hopefully here soon. I, I mean, I just don't know why waiting four days would, would, have, would have a huge impact. I, I agree that, 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 that we can't give, you know, <laughs> That we can't just give the run and show to you know whoever has a comment. We 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 we, we, we address them all anyway. I want there to be the opportunity out there, and my concern is that we just that that that, that hasn't happened. I mean, I do, four days does not seem to be like much of a stretch. I'd be happy to vote yes for this thing on Monday once folks have have, have a chance to look and say, okay, we agree with this, and if they and if everybody agrees with this thing, great. Then it's on record, more or less. People said. People sign on to something after reviewing it. They can then we can then tell them if they have an issue with it. You had a chance to read it. You had a chance to review it. Right now we're just kind of flying blind. It's just these 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 circumstances are just so crazy. And believe me, I do appreciate the work that everybody's done in putting this to you know plan together. I do appreciate that. Believe me, I do. My question is more about just the timing of it and. I want to be transparent, as transparent as we can, because God forbid something goes wrong. I mean, we think it's chaos now. Imagine if somebody gets sick, and we, you know, during during the during these preseason times, it just scares me. I know kids and co coaches are um, already organizing. Um, there are coach, there's captains' practices that are are happening in sports that my kids are playing. So, um my feeling is getting the plan approved and make it the official guidance going forward improves the safety rather than having kids just choosing to gather um, and you know run the sessions on their own um, and i think that if we were able to approve it tonight um, it gets broadcast tomorrow uh, mr dunnegy gives a summary tells people where to look um, parents and students can um, act on it when they're comfortable and ready. If that's Monday morning, great. If they wanna take the time to review and ask questions, they can do that. But um, I think for me, I think I have enough information to proceed. Can I get a motion? Bridget, I think. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the question. Can I get a motion for approval of this? I think we already did it, didn't we? Yes. Okay, so we're moved in second. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's vote. You want a roll call? Yeah, roll call, please. Okay, Dr. Christman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Fleischer. No. Miss Larson. No. Miss Minji. Yes. Mr. Cinto. Yes. Uh, Mr. Schwartz. No. Uh, 
Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Uh, Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Okay. I have six, six voting yes. Six, six, six to three. Okay, motion carries. Thanks everybody. I, I appreciate that this is a, you know, we're in uncharted waters here, but I would say we just, we spent a lot of time on a 30 page report to cover three weeks of preseason of sports. So I hope everybody gets a lot of rest between now and the end of the month when we're gonna have to approve a plan, uh, an actual plan for the school district to operate. You know? But thank, thank you all for your input. Maybe we can get that plan before the night we vote on it and the public can have a chance to consume it. <laughs> I, I would like to say that the information that is being shared since July 7th is, so you're hearing this along, along the way. We recognize that that's way too much information to provide any, anybody. Uh, you know, trying to make a decision that night. It's why we requested the additional meetings um, and are working really hard to make sure that you have enough information to make what you truly can believe is a well-informed decision that you, that you are comfortable with. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, I'll accept the motion to approve policy number 204, attendance and administrative regulations. Snodgrass Chris, moved. Chris and second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Can we just have um, just a quick reminder what this is? Because I think we discussed it at a previous meeting. Right. So policy 204 uh, is simply reflecting the change in state law regarding the definition of compulsory school age um, uh, from used to be uh, age eight to 17, now it's, it's going to be six to 18. So that the policy, uh, the policy reflects that change and the ARs that go along with the policy also reflect that change. Great, thanks Greg. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Board reports. Ari, you got anything? Not tonight, too late. Antoinette? No report. And Antoinette, congratulations again from, from the whole board. <laughs> Thanks, I was gonna say um, in the last two weeks I had a baby, so I don't have anything else to report. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great report. That's the best report we've had all year. <laughs> Thank you. Dave, you got anything? You know, it's 2211 and I'm still on vacation. So I'm going to go on and, and have a cold drink. But congrats to, 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 to Antoinette as well. And yeah, I'll have a report next, next, <laughs> next week, I guess. Well, enjoy your vacation. Kristen? No report. Laura? Um, yeah, no report. Sal? Uh, Antoinette, congratulations uh, on on your new baby. And um, I'd just like to say thank you to our community um, and to the people who are administrators and teachers in our district for putting in the hard work. Um, we're all taking this process together and there's new things that we have to learn as well. Um, and just for the record, I, I don't think that insulting each other in this context is a benefit to anyone. So if I have in any way seemed as if I was attacking someone personally, I apologize, but moving forward, I do not think that insulting each other in this context as representatives of our district is in any way beneficial to making the best decisions moving forward. Thank you, Sal. Susan, I understand you have, you, you have a new arrival too. I have so a new arrival too. I have a brand new Nate <laughs> and he's two weeks old and I'm actually walking without a walker. I have a cane and I will tell one one thing I resent I resent for myself the two years that I waited to have it done because I'm already in transition and it's wonderful. So I wish I had it done, but yes, I'm I'm out of the woods. I expect I to see you in the window at the dance studio on Haverford. You saw me. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm going. There you go. 
That's it. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Susan. Bridget, you got anything else? I do not. It's it's been a good night with a lot of content and good discussion. And um, I'm gonna sign off here at quarter to eleven. Thanks, everybody. And I thank the members of the community who uh, who who have who are who hung in and are still with us. Um, uh, I have no executive session report this evening. We didn't uh, go into any any uh, uh, items there. Our next regular public board meeting will be held on July 16th, 2020 uh, via Zoom. And with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Snodgrass Ooh. moved. Second. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks.